Hello, friends. Thanks for coming back to listen to the program. Uh, I don't know about all the listeners around the world, but in North America land right now, it's... Oh, she's a real scorcher out there. So I hope everybody's keeping cool, not uh, burning to death, or laying on the floor, crying in a pile of their own sweat. So maybe get a nice bathtub full of ice cubes and take it easy. And on this episode, I have back again, uh, Nicholas Smith. If you didn't hear the the ninth episode of the show, uh, Nicholas was on that episode. He is a mining engineer uh, from Sudbury, Ontario. And on the previous episode with him, we discussed uh, masks and the advocacy that he's been doing around masks and his run-ins with the press and uh, various members of government in Canada. And on this episode, we don't really run over particulars of, of masks and respirators themselves. We, we, we did that quite a bit at last time, and since then I've talked to two other guests who've gone over a lot of detail on masks themselves, and so we didn't really need to go any further on that. I think there's enough masky goodness to go around on the program thus far. So if you're interested more on the particulars of masks themselves, go back, listen to the last episode with Nick, as well as the episode with uh, Sri Sri Krishna and with Aaron Collins. Now, so in this one, we dive much more into what we we're also discussing last time, how the press in Canada and to a degree in the United States have no willingness, it would appear, to go against quite a lot that the public health authorities have to say, which are just government body or the politicians themselves and are just a, a mouthpiece of this bureaucratic driven narrative. And as I've discussed in, on other topics throughout the show, this has been a pro- huge problem beyond masks. Same with airborne transmission and uh, same with specific uh, policy measures and same with the lab leak hypothesis. It would seem that the powers that be are good at getting things wrong as often as they get things right. And so this entire episode really runs on that theme. And in highlighting the issue, Nick is absolutely fantastic at showing the depth of this particular problem and the amount of work that he's put into the particular issue of masks and respirators and getting them to healthcare workers as well as members of the public is quite admirable. And he's doing it in a absolutely tireless fashion. You know, ever since I've come into contact with him, this seems to be something that he's doing constantly every day. And, uh, I hold him in in quite high regard for that. So I was very pleased to have Nick back on the show. And uh, as you'll see in the length, this is the the longest episode so far. He's an absolutely uh, easy person to talk to. I really enjoyed uh, doing this episode, just as I did doing the last episode with him. And I hope you find this episode thought-provoking. So, I'll let you dive in. Enjoy. Cheers, guys. All right. Well, Nick, thanks for coming back. And it looks like it, uh, it's been, I think, a couple of months now since we, we last talked on here. And it looks like on Twitter, you've been a, a massive pain in the ass to the, the mainstream press in, in Canada, as well as uh, a bunch of politicians. Um, so, let's start with, it looks like CBC finally did some uh, coverage on what you've been working on, although they didn't really seem to address you directly, but uh, primarily the, the the topics that you've been working on uh, in regard to, to uh, utilizing different masks in, in different environments. So let everybody know what's been going on there. So basically the CBC journalists I worked with on that story, Natalia Goodwin, 
I had worked from her from no, with her from November to March to try and convince her producers it was worth investigating. But since politicians and unions were refusing to speak out and say it was a problem that was worth looking into, her, produce, her first eight producers said, no, it's not even worth looking into. And then finally in March, she got the go ahead. Um, and then she even asked me to not talk to other journalists so she can have the exclusive. And I thought, you know, that's great. It's going to come out in a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden, a month later, she still hadn't come out. So I was wondering what's going on. And then she told me, you know, they this, her producers decided to actually uh, turn it into three stories. So the first story was actually going to be from the unions themselves about how they're looking for higher levels of protection and then a brief mention of elastomeric respirators. And then the second part was going to be the one that was released a couple of weeks ago about the 100,000 respirators being kept from healthcare workers, the unions fight. And it was supposed to include the negligence by politicians. Uh, and then the third one that was supposed to come out and it looks like the CBC is not going to write anything about it at all is about the problems with manufacturers and how manufacturers keep having hurdles placed in front of them. They're closing and that they've had millions of N95s available, but all these bureaucratic hurdles being placed in front of them is uh, causing them to go out of business or slow production to almost nothing. Um, and then the CBC back in March, she told me, oh, it was coming out soon. It's coming out soon. And then her producers decided other stories were more important. So she wrote a story about uh, speed limits in uh, uh, Ottawa residential zone going down by 10 kilometers. So that's what, for some reason, CBC thought that speed huge limits story. Could reduce. Huge story that uh, <laughs> would save thousands of lives by reducing the speed limit by tens of kilometers, by 10 kilometers. And then uh, finally, I told her like I was going to start talking to other journalists. So she started pressuring her producers and she's like, oh, it's going to come out. It's going to come out. And then she told me it would come out like within a few days. And then all of a sudden, uh, five days after that, she said she had to go work as a producer. So she had to put it on hold. And then finally it got released. And I found out uh, 12 hours after it was released from her telling me, but I found out like before she even told me the article. And then she told me, the CBC didn't want to include the political negligence. They wanted to keep the story simple. And then there wasn't going to be a follow-up because they were wanting to talk about ventilation and other problems. So it was just going to be a one and done story um, with no actual talk about who, which politicians were negligent, why it took so long for the CBC to look into the story and so, so and so. And uh, so it, it, it was great that it came out and it was a great investigation. The new video is great as well, but she didn't even include any mention of my work or my involvement, even though all the experts she got was from uh, experts I got for her, all the resources she used in the news articles from me. And I was told her like the importance of me being known for some of the work I do, because then I could go to corporations, get these corporations to realize the importance of being able to buy these respirators to donate them to other people. And also to let me be able to talk to other news organizations and things like that with my name more out there. Uh, but she decided not to include my name or even thank me in the article or anything for any of the things I did. And uh, I lost a lot of time because she asked me not to talk to other journalists. So it's, uh, I thought the CBC was going to take it seriously, but it's not just like in June of last year, it took four weeks for the CBC to get back to me to tell me that because the government was refusing to answer any of their questions about why they were refusing to let the public know elastomeric respirators were recommended, she couldn't take my word that they were actually recommended and safe. She couldn't take the word of Radio Canada when they published their investigation the month before. She couldn't take the CDC recommendations. She couldn't interview anybody. Uh, I got her because these experts were from outside of Ontario and some of these experts ran the CDC. And uh, so she couldn't do anything at all. So that wasn't uh, taken out. And then uh, in July of, uh, or I guess, well, we're June now. So I guess 12 months ago in July, Judy Trin, who works for the CBC in the fifth estate, I tried to embarrass the CBC to talk about how they were <laughs> refusing to talk about this. And by this time, like it was clear there was a problem. And so a CBC journalist apologized to me, told me, uh, she was going to be letting other journalists know to get a hold of me because it wasn't right that they weren't looking into it. And then Judy Trin all of a sudden the next day got back to me saying she suddenly had time to look into this problem. She was supposed to interview Simon Smith, the expert that explained why cloth and surgical masks are ineffective, as well as um, Kevin Hedges, the president of Workplace uh, Without Borders, and who's a PhD with uh, the Occupational Health Clinics Without Ontario Workers. But then as she was supposed to interview them, she called them right before 
or it might have been, been half an hour later to let them know that she was actually going to from Ottawa to Toronto for another case. So she would have to reschedule the interview till the week after. And then the week after, uh, they both set up, they were going to do an interview with her at the same time. And then a week after, an hour after she was supposed to contact them, she said, now I'm working on a documentary. Uh, I'm not going to have time to interview you. I'm going to pass your information along to Emily Chung, I believe it was, from Ottawa, CBC Ottawa, and she'll contact us. No contact ever. I email, call, nothing. And then uh, in October, when I talked to the CBC uh, grant from the CBC Toronto newsroom, uh, I talked to him on the phone and he was supposed to look into it and get his uh, some of his journalists to look into it, but they never did. And that was at the same time that Directive 5 came out where the Ontario government said they needed to have N95s at a minimum for when it was high risk procedures and things like that. And they could ask for it. Um, so it's just drop ball after drop ball. They, the CBC doesn't seem like they want to let the public know about the negligence going on. Uh, it seems like they, they were happy to let them know about the negligence with the Ford government, but not the negligence involved by the NDP and Liberals, which was uh, clearly an issue since uh, she had direct evidence about the involvement by Francine, uh, Jamie West, Carol Hughes, Don Davies, and even uh, uh, MP Ryan Turnbull from Whitby, who is part of Justin Trudeau's party, who in February let the ministers know about the importance of letting the public know the last American respirators were safe. He also asked them to pr ask, simply pressure or ask for it to distribute them so that unions wouldn't have to keep fighting secretly to get these respirators distributed. And then that didn't work. So he let me know he was trying to get an internal letter so that it would be enough since the government wasn't admitting that there was airborne uh, transmission going on. He let me know like damn well, he knows damn well that it's not droplet and it's airborne PPE we need. He went to the emergency room himself. He was also saying how upset he was to see them all in surgical masks and how something needed to be urgently done. So he was gonna get MPs to sign an internal letter in April. Uh, but that internal letter wasn't enough to convince the government to even let the public know these respirators were safe or that this problem was going on. And since there's an election coming, he decided to stop even talking about elastomeric respirators or admitting that the government knew airborne transmission was happening. And uh, as you saw from last week, uh, Joe Vipon's great article in the Toronto Star, and then, um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to remember her name. Uh, she, uh, she ended up having, um, being able to, uh, to release a lot of the studies from the Canadian government that have been hidden from the public where they told the Public Health Agency of Canada to not give these, um, Crystal Mundy, sorry, to mm -hmm. not give the studies on airborne transmission or the transmission uh, amongst schools and things like that, that for some reason, it should have been public knowledge because without the knowledge of what's going on, how can we fight a response? How can we mount a proper defense against the virus? And when all the provinces continue to say there's no evidence of airborne transmission, but the federal government has these studies from over a year ago that prove they know that it's common and it's actually dangerous and it's one of the most common forms and it wasn't droplet protection yet the federal government decides it's not worth to let the public know uh, that the provinces are wrong that they're misleading the public and that we should be having better protections uh, because they still seem to think cloth masks are good enough and that it doesn't matter even if the u.s government finally admitted that surgical masks are too dangerous to use around covid patients because two weeks ago, uh, the CDC changed their uh, guidelines right. to protect healthcare workers. And they actually said, you know what? All the experts along this entire time were right. Surgical masks are dangerous. So now we're banning their use among suspected or confirmed patients. And only elastomeric respirators and N95s are used. And even one step further, they're recommending hospitals use elastomeric respirators instead of N95s for AGMPs, the highest risk procedures, because they have extra protections. Uh, while in Canada, we can't even say the word elastomeric respirators. The, we have 100,000 that's been available for over a year, paid for with taxpayer dollars, and that would prevent the need for buying PPE that doesn't even protect healthcare workers. But the government's deciding to spend all their time to fight uh, to keep this information hidden from the public, to fight unions to keep healthcare workers in surgical masks. And they're telling healthcare workers to use surgical masks around confirmed COVID patients, despite knowing that those directions are going to lead to more infections and deaths among healthcare workers. Yeah, overall, it's, it's not too surprising because this has gone on for over a year now, uh, trying to get uh, the, the idea through to, to public health authorities that you know, recognizing airborne transmission is imperative and there's been such strong pushback and even what it seems that the, the, the CDC have done lately, like they, 
they've they've made this this weird concession to where you know if you have if you're vaccinated you don't have to wear a mask and, and you know they're 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 trying to set up these really arbitrary guidelines and there's like it's not completely without merit but it's it's clearly political it it has it has nothing to do with with, with actually actually looking at uh the 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 medical aspect of it all it's it's purely political and even as you mentioned the the cdc making some changes with healthcare workers well they they should be letting the public know in in all indoor settings especially ones with with a lot of people indoors that surgical masks and stupid cloth masks are also you know not really doing a hell of a lot and that people should be looking into KF94s and KN95s and N95s if they're in the office or at Costco or whatever. Um, so even even then, they have a long way to go. But uh, overall, I'm not too surprised that Health Canada is still just completely useless and incompetent on this whole issue. But as we we talked about before, the weirdest part. Oh, as as bad as as it uh, how long it's taking uh, Health Canada to change their policies is that the CBC just capitulates to whatever the Canadian public health authorities and the various governments have to say, which is Ooh. insane and it's anathema to what they should be doing. So to to backtrack, um, I did see the the little video clip that came out from CBC Auto, uh, like midday television or whatever. And, you know, it, it was, as you anticipate, it was, you know, a short little clip of, you know, typical TV theatrics, and it was really schmaltzy and really didn't have much to say about anything. They interviewed one gentleman and, you know, chopped it up into a couple, you know, quasi worthwhile sound bites and didn't really have much to say about anything, but better than absolutely nothing, I suppose. But I, I didn't actually read the, read the article. Um, what, what what did that have to say specifically? You said what it didn't say, which is also so, sadly not surprising. But like, what did what did the article actually have to say, if much more beyond the video clip? So it talked about how unions were fighting the uh, the Ontario government for over a year in court to get their uh, the last Ameri- hundred thousand last American respirators distributed, and that there's no reason surgical masks should be used since they don't properly form to the face and seal, which allows air to go through the gaps. So they explained again why it's important to use elastomeric respirators. They explained that it was an alternative to N95s uh, and that it even performed better than an N95. Um, They talked about uh, how ambulance centers and dentists were already using them. And they even, because the Ontario government has refused to officially acknowledge that there's 100,000 respirators, they actually had to use Franchini Nuz uh, own Facebook post from last year to prove that they had the 100,000 because while she refuses to let the public know that these respirators are available and that they've recommended as N95, she did try and take the credit for it a year ago after the government bought it. Um, even though after she publicly posted that, she refused to even ask for these respirators to be distributed the entire six months later when she begged the government for N95s because she knew healthcare workers were dying without them and how long-term care homes haven't had them. And it's, it's a very scary thing because one of the first news articles to come out about elastomeric respirators and, uh, and the Canadian and Ontario government looking into it, Francine was actually interviewed along with Carol Hughes. And during that interview, she even said, the surgical mask is known to only protect the person from spreading it to others, but it doesn't protect the wearer, but that the government proved that the N95s uh, protect the wearer and the person that they could spread it to in elastomeric respirators that had at least been proven to protect the wearer uh, as equally as N95s. So right there, that should have been concerning that what healthcare workers were using was known to not be able to protect them. And despite all the deaths, and then even in May, when the Ontario and Canadian government said, you know, the only option is available is N95 reuse. Well, she should have said, well, no, that's not the only option available. We have lost American respirators, which are recommended, especially when there's N95 shortages. And if it's not short, why are you reusing it? Because it's dangerous to reuse it. But of course, that's not a conversation that politicians like. So the politicians only like sound bites and to make themselves look like they're actually working for the people and will they'll do anything. But uh, they actually they actually won't even do their regular duties. Like I asked for criticism from the health critics. Criticism was not too much of a 
ask. I asked them to just simply ask the government to distribute them so that healthcare workers or so unions wouldn't have to fight with them. That was too much. I asked them to remove the misinformation where some of the politicians, including Foss and Carol, said they were dangerous, and also the uh, Canadian and Ontario websites that said they were dangerous. And that wasn't important because healthcare workers wouldn't want them. Then after I got Doug Ford to buy 100000 from the internal investigation, and Franchina told me healthcare workers wouldn't want them, so it wasn't worth criticizing for, for it. I said, well, how the fuck do you think healthcare workers <laughs> don't want them? They're dying, and they don't even know these are safe or recommended. They're actively being prevented from using them. Unions have said for months they want them. Couldn't you at least simply ask unions about the respirators you said confirmed is as equal as an N95 and that is what you're lacking for? No, no interest in talking to unions. So it wasn't until two months later when I spoke to the pres or CEO of the Ontario Nursing Association, Bev Mathers, that she even found out the government wasn't going to distribute them because originally she was supposed to be told when they received 100,000, which was in mid-July, but by mid-September, she hadn't even been told that they had received them or that they weren't going to distribute them. Uh, so that should have been shocking both to unions and to opposition uh, parties that something is something seriously is going wrong. And since nothing was done, and t over 20,000 healthcare workers in Ontario got infected, many died. And a couple weeks ago, one of the workers that died, or not, sorry, one of the workers that got infected at Roberta Bondar place, he just got his two new sets of lungs. So I don't know what would be better for the government to, for, to give a respirator that they already paid for so that nobody even gets infected or to now have to pay this guy permanent disability for life because he has two lungs. So he's not most likely not gonna be able to have his career as he wanted as a PSW or healthcare worker. And he's gonna have to take all kinds of medication for his rest of his life. He's gonna be having immune system problems. And right now it doesn't even look like the government's interested in even, uh, even ensuring that the healthcare workers have better protection before the Delta variant is coming. Mm -hmm. And Australia has announced last week that they've shown it only takes seconds and somebody walking by to infect somebody with the Delta variant. Mm -hmm. And so that clearly shows it's airborne. It's not droplet protection. And so all it's going to take for our healthcare workers going into the rooms with the patients is for them to wear the surgical mask that they're forced to use and then they'll get infected. And it also shows the vaccines like Pfizer aren't as effective against the Delta variant. So they might get some protection. But the UK has shown that from June 8th to June 14th, half the people that died in the UK from the Delta variant were people that were fully vaccinated. So if you're fully vaccinated, half the deaths are from people in fully vaccinated. There's a serious problem going on. And we don't need to keep going with surgical masks, which have shown to infect people with the less contagious variants, including the regular one. We need the best protection available. And because we're not giving them the N95s and elastomeric respirators, a lot of manufacturers are actually going under. And so when the government does finally get their head out of their asses, they're going to say, okay, use N95s and elastomeric respirators, but then these companies might not be around to be able to offer these to them. So it's, it's a shame. The association I helped Lloyd Armbrust form in uh, late February, the American Mass Manufacturers Association, it's only been a few months and more than half the manufacturers are gone. Over 3,000 people have lost their jobs. And even, I believe it was a week ago, one of the companies that can produce 1.2 billion masks a year have gone under and now they're scrapping their, their mask lines. So you think it's a pandemic and that's when you make your most sales. And you think also that's when you use your stockpiles of PPE. But as a CBC article said, they're stockpiling these 100,000 respirators. So they gave out 22,000 and they still have over 100,000 left, but they're saving them for the future. So I don't know what kind of future there's going to be if we don't protect our healthcare workers now because they're already dying. They're, they're quitting the profession and they're not going to be staying around. And the ones that are going to get infected, develop long haul COVID, they're going to have all kinds of issues as well. And they're not going to be properly be able to do their duties. They're going to have brain problems, heart problems, lung problems, kidney problems. And it's going to be problems that are going to affect them possibly for the rest of their lives. And they don't want to wait another year to get these respirators distributed because there's no point in keeping these respirators for another year. They're reusable. If the government says we're keeping them for the future, what's the problem with using them now? Because you can use them now and in the future, which is exactly what Zanae Cortez, the president of National Nurses United, said in May of last year during the first wave. 
She said hospitals were actively telling their nurses they didn't need the elastomeric respirators because they were going to be kept for future waves, but nurses kept dying. They had N95s locked up. There was a nurse from Los Angeles who had her patient uh, start having a heart attack. She didn't have time to go find someone in the other side of the hospital to get a key to open up a cage to get an N95 and then go rush to save that patient having a heart attack. She ended up going right into the room uh, like she was trained, did CPR, and even though a patient died two days later, she ended up getting infected and dying two weeks after uh, because of that. And there's no excuse when the elastomeric respirators would have prevented that. And there's 3,600 people or 3,600 healthcare workers alone that died in the U.S. And it's been shown that it was because of the surgical masks. And on top of that, there's no investigation into why the CDC has said to that surgical masks were safe in fighting with the public. Because in 2017 and 2019, Lou Radonovich from the CDC came out with presentations that can be found on the CDC website and on a conference he presented in front of. And his presentation from the CDC explained that surgical masks should not be used during a pandemic because they allowed gaps and that the infectious particles could pass through. They were saying that during any pandemic, uh, future pandemic, they were expecting N95 shortages to occur like SARS and H1N1, and they only had 1% of the stockpile they needed. So it was expected that the shortages were occurred. And the only way to prevent harm from coming to healthcare workers would be to quickly transition to elastomeric respirators and that they were overlooked and not well understood. So that NIOSH would be the, per, the uh, agency to quickly train and educate the public. Yet the CDC, except for changing things on their website, they're not, they haven't had a press conference since the start of the pandemic to say elastomeric respirators are even safe or recommended. So most people don't even know they're an option. And then the entire time they're saying N95 should be reused up to 50 times. They never said, you know, reuse, reuse the disposable or use the disposables or use respirators we recommend that are made to be reused for years at a time. And it's strange because it was also during SARS and H1N1 where the CDC explained that face masks and, and uh, surgical masks weren't effective and they should only be used as a last option. And they were recommending elastomeric respirators in 2003 and 2009. So how is it that not a single person from the CDC said, you know, what the hell is going on? Why aren't we letting the public know about these recommendations to use elastomeric respirators? That was the plan the entire time. And instead of following our plan, we allowed the N95 shortages to happen as expected. And instead of following our recommendations to use elastomeric respirators and avoid surgical masks, we told everybody to use surgical masks and we refused to say anything about elastomeric respirators so they'd be avoided. And even when they talk about elastomeric respirators, they say they're dangerous and impossible to communicate in. And then they don't tell the public that there's healthcare worker versions that are easy to communicate through, that there's no exhalation valves in a lot of them now, um, and that there's dozens of manufacturers. So people when they think of elastomeric respirators, often all they think is 3M and they don't realize that there's all these healthcare worker versions. There's even some with clear fronts so that people that are hard of hearing could be able to read lips and that they, they're more comfortable so that they can actually be used for long periods of time without cutting into the face like some N95 skin. And it, it's such a strange world because back in June of last year, the American College of Surgeons came out with a study with 2000 healthcare workers and not a single healthcare worker after four weeks of using their own elastomeric respirator want to go back to N95. And it mm -hmm. also showed that it reduced costs by over 90% in the first month alone. And now since they're reusable for years at a time, if they can save 90% in the first month and you don't really have to buy anything for the next 11 months, imagine the savings compared to that. So instead of 90%, it's going to be like a 98% or 99% cost savings because you're not, you're spending... For example, if we would have protected every single healthcare worker in the U.S., it would have caught with their own elastomeric respirator. It would have cost under three hundred million, and then we don't have to worry about buying four dollar N95s and paying four hundred million dollars to a company to uh, disinfect the N95s. It would have been cheaper just to give them the better recommended PPE from the very start. So it's not only lives it's going to save; it's it's like taxpayers. But now the CDC said, oh, now we can't recommend widespread use in healthcare settings. We have to do another tr trial and it's not going to be over until December of 2021. We want to see if healthcare workers are going to want to use these respirators. So 2,000 out of 2,000 healthcare workers is not a good enough case study to show how well they were liked. We want to know if they can easily be trained and fit tested. So the 2,000 healthcare workers that were quickly fit tested, trained and evaluated during the first wave wasn't enough evidence to show it could easily be done. 
and even uh, some of the webinars, like back in February of this year, they had a webinar showing how universities and like colleges in the U.S. they they showed in uh, hospitals it showed it could be take less than a week to quickly train, fit, test, and evaluate healthcare workers on the use of elastomeric respirators. So that's one week. So we don't need to spend a hundred weeks to figure out how to get it done. We could have had it done well over a year ago, and then we wouldn't have had the spread in the hospitals. We could have protected the vulnerable people in long-term care and the patients in hospitals as well. And since hospital spread could have been contained and mitigated, we wouldn't have had to cancel all the surgeries. We wouldn't have had to cancel procedures. So a lot of cancers that are going to be missed and they're going to be found in later stages, people are going to die because of that. And Mm -hmm. we could have kept everything going on and just made sure that healthcare workers were protected, which is what came out of SARS was we need to protect healthcare workers during a pandemic with the highest levels of protection and not surgical masks, but N95s and elastomeric respirators. And even on July 6th in the House of Commons, Mario Possumai explained uh, to a House of Commons committee he was invited to on how to better prepare for the second wave that was coming. And he explained that, you know, the Canadian government at first said there was no evidence that healthcare workers needed anything better than surgical masks. And And if it wasn't enough, you'd see healthcare workers getting infected when they use surgical masks. And his first intro, he's like, you know, since that time, one in five cases has been a healthcare worker. And he explained, we N95s are not the only solution. We need to go to elastomeric respirators. We need to ur- urgently let the public have the best information. And the Public Health Agency of Canada is not even sharing information. And uh, there's lots of people like Don Davies that were part and asked questions about like the government and why we're not using the precautionary principle and things like that. But none of these politicians that were even part of the the uh, meeting are now speaking out about the failure to listen to Mario Possumai's recommendations for a year ago and to use elastomeric respirators. And Don Davies, out of any, anyone, should know because it was the NDP that helped me. And it was in July, he even asked me personally, he's like, obviously these respirators are great uh, and they should be used. What do you suggest I do? And then I asked him, you know, talk to Franchina because at that time I wasn't really criticizing the NDP. I was still praising them, hoping they'd eventually criticize the government or at least bring it up in an important. So I said, you know, I, I don't want the NDP to look bad for not saying anything. So please talk to Franchina so you can arrange um, a press conference or something together so the NDP looks good and they don't look negligent for not saying anything for all this time. And then he said he was going on vacation for a week. He talked to France after the week. And then he talked to her. And then a week later, he said, you know, uh, I'm not a scientist. I can't share the recommendations, the Health Canada recommendations to use the respirators. And I said, you don't need to be a scientist. The scientists already are the ones who made the recommendations and that's why they're recommended. And I said, you know, you should hold a press conference uh, to let the public know this is going on and ask for accountability because a lot of healthcare workers had already died by this point. And if there's nothing that's being done and no accountability, these problems are just going to keep going and they're going to be overlooked and people are going to keep dying and we're going to lose our opportunity to stop the spread and prevent the outbreaks. And he said, no, I'm not an expert. I can't have, I can't uh, talk about this with an expert with a press conference either. And uh, so nothing was done. And then because unions often refuse to speak about it, when I go to journalists, they say, well, politicians like the NDP and the liberals aren't saying anything and unions aren't speaking up, then obviously it can't be a serious enough concern. (laughs) <laughs> and um, I had the CEO of the Ontario Nursing Association, Bev Mathers, criticize me for criticizing the Ontario Nursing Association for not asking politicians for help, for not speaking out about journalists. And she said, you know, it's not important enough to even use social media. We're not going to waste our time tweeting about this problem or issuing a Facebook post because we want to focus on N95s. I'm like, why the fuck would you focus on N95s when the government already has 100,000 respirators? All they have to do is distribute them. You know they're reusable, so it'll give your healthcare workers N95 level protection for years to come, and that way they don't have to reuse the N95 ever again. And she said, well, you know what? I'll compromise. If you can get them to come to us, we'll say something. So I was able to get the Radio Canada journalist to do that in December. So she admitted that it was one of the biggest problems and healthcare workers were actively prevented from using them. But then after that, nothing came out. And the union didn't even talk about that Radio Canada investigation. So they, it got overlooked. And that's why it took 
me so long to get the CBC in for an Italian to to producers because if unions can't talk about it, then obviously it can't be an important enough issue. And even though it's now been two weeks since that CBC came out, I can't get a politician to talk about it. I can't get a union to, to talk about it. The only union that is even helping me is QP and Michael Hurley. Um, but I'm, I've been asking Michael to hold a press conference in QP and, and they, they don't think it's necessarily important that now there's no shortages and things like that. And I tell them, you know, that it's not just about healthcare workers and elastomeric respirators. It's more than that. It's, you know, letting other businesses know, let other unions know that their cloth masks are going to result in infections. But if they know they can ask the government for elastomeric respirators or even the companies, if it's not a government, if they're not representing like uh, government employees, they can ask the companies to buy these respirators because for the company, it's going to be cheaper to buy these respirators and then the companies won't have outbreaks. So if you look at the food plants, sometimes they have to close the food plant for two weeks. They have to close uh, Amazon facility. They have to close uh, postal facilities and there's no, and these companies lose a lot more money by doing that than if they were to buy a single last American respirators for all their employees and then they would never get infected at all. But because the focus is just on healthcare workers and they assume it's not worth it, they're not going to speak out for their brothers and sisters and other unions. Uh, they're not even asking for accountability. So the people that died, they're not even asking for accountability for their families that died. They're not saying, well, why did, why are you fighting us for, to keep us in surgical masks? And when people have died in the surgical masks and we, sh and you know that last American respirators will prevent these deaths, but there's no accountability and I can't even get them to criticize the government. So it's like, it's not, it's a non-existent problem. And people like Jamie West, like they, he was tweeting me even after the Radio Canada article on Twitter, he would say, oh, there's no evidence anybody but me is asking for last American respirators. And unless they go to him directly, he's not going to say anything. But then when he emailed me, he said, oh, that list of resources you provided me was really good. And that uh, video clip with Michael Hurley talking about how uh, one of the, the, the reasons the virus is able to spread in long term care is because they're not using it. But then he still refused to speak up. So it's been two weeks since the CBC article came out. So hopefully that CBC article showing how unions are fighting for over a year is good enough to show that it's not just me asking. But worst of all, it's now been two weeks since the CDC said surgical masks are too dangerous to use and they've admitted that they were wrong. And nobody in Canada, is, no politician in Canada is even bringing that up. And that would be an important thing to know that, you know, what everybody's using is not safe and it's banned in the US, but somehow it's the primary thing that's being used. And when people fight and say it's not safe, the government says, no, no, it's safe, it's safe. All we, we only need droplet protections. And then they ignore the fact that elastomeric respirators provide droplet protections as well. So there's no excuse to keep these respirators. And, they, and uh, a lot of companies are, are going under. So we're losing any opportunity for future help. And because they're not saying anything, other countries like the third world uh, where they could also use these respirators and companies could donate them. Uh, yeah. They're not donating them. So back when I started my campaign, mining companies had a lot of elastomeric respirators because they're used instead of N95s at mining operations because they want the best respirators for, for their employees because of how dangerous the chemicals are and, and that they use, or even when they're blasting and things like that and the rocks that they could be mining are dangerous and could cause uh, cancers down the road. So they give elastomeric respirators and you get laughed at if you're, if you come with an N95 and you get kicked off site, if you bring an N95. Now it's the same technology, except uh, elastomeric respirator provides 99.997% protection versus 95% of an N95, but it also doesn't fail you. So if you're performing, for example, CPR, uh, N95s have been shown to fail one quarter of the time while performing occupational CPR, while elastomeric respirators never fail. So now with all these COVID wards and all these healthcare workers being forced to use surgical masks on their uh, COVID patients, when they're coding and when they have to give uh, CPR, they're, even if they are lucky enough to get an N95, there's a one in four chance that it could expose them if their patient's also infectious. So it, it, it doesn't really make any sense. And there's no good excuse after an entire year for the government to be fighting unions to prevent this. It, it, it's just unfathomable that they don't care that people are dying. It's hurting the economy and they can't say, you know, we're wrong. We made, we made mistakes. We fucked up. 
And, but we're going to try and fix our mistakes. We're going to get you the better protection that you've been asking for for over a year. But even in the U.S., uh, on April 9th, when the U.S. government officially declared the PPE shortage over, uh, it was due to the work that AMA and Lloyd Armbrust did with the American mass manufacturers because they showed they had over 300 N95 sitting in warehouses because the government was refusing to let people know that they were available and recommended. And they still banned uh, PPE ads, which are still banned. And instead of letting the public know that the shortage was over, which is, you know, a major milestone, it should be on a bullhorn at every street corner that there's no longer a PPE shortage, they sent letters to the hospitals. So letters to hospitals is not going to be an effective way to make sure the entire American public and businesses know the PPE shortage is over, that Facebook knows it's over. And then a few weeks later, when the U.S. government finally said that it's airborne, they didn't even say, they didn't even hold a press conference, they updated their web page And then they got called out by CNN, New York Times. And it was a few days after that that they got called out for not even letting the public know that they updated to finally admit they were wrong. They didn't apologize to anybody or say, you know, now we're going to implement the airborne protections that everyone's been asking for a year now that we admit it's airborne. Uh, we're going to say, you know what, we're going to have a press conference and we're going to have a media circus. So anybody who's vaccinated, you don't even have to wear a mask at all. So now instead of saying we made mistakes and we're going to, And we're going to make sure that people have the right masks. We're going to say, don't wear any masks at all. And now it's showing with the Delta variant that it's so contagious, even with the vaccines, uh, people could die and they have uh, a lot worse hospitalizations as well, even with the, with full, with both full doses. And now we're saying in like, for example, Alberta and other places, uh, take off your mask indoors. You don't have to worry about it. So people that are, going to be working in these places, even if they have their vaccines, they're still only given like surgical masks or cloth masks. So they're going to be at high risk of exposure. And since these people that are not going to be infected, they're not going to necessarily even realize they're infected because they have vaccines and they're going to spread it to more people. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to cause more outbreaks. And then we're going to end up <laughs> having to close in four weeks or six weeks, more economy again and say, whoops, how did we couldn't have seen this coming? Uh, now the only way to stop it is to close businesses. And now the only places that are going to be open is Walmart, Costco, and all the places that uh, give money to the government. But places like hairdressers, restaurants, they're going to suffer. And all the ones that didn't uh, close up to now, they're probably going to close because they're not going to be able to re reclose for another four weeks and lose all that money again. And we're just going to keep this shenanigans going. And it, it, they have yet to apologize for any of it to all the families that lost loved ones. Uh, you know, healthcare, it's not just the healthcare workers that are dying. They get infected and then bring it home. And then their, their husbands, wives, children get infected. They die. Um, the healthcare workers are getting strokes and things like that. Mm. And even there's a warehouse worker in Toronto uh, a month ago, he got infected. He had all his coworkers got infected. He had to go to work anyways. He got infected. He went home. He got his wife got infected and then his wife died. So it's not just the frontline workers we have to worry about, but they spread it to their households and then it, those households spread it to their children. So it, even in Finland in May, when they said, you know, four out of five cases of the new Delta variant spreading in, in Finland was in partially or fully vaccinated individuals, seven out of the first 80 cases died. So it showed That's quite a bit more than just a one or two percent uh, uh, mortality rate, and it shows that the healthcare workers that had surgical masks were fully vaccinated, still got really, really sick. And then they said because the healthcare workers got sick, the, their children spread got it, and then they spread in school, so it caused school outbreaks. So how are we going to be able to prevent this if we we're saying children don't get sick, they don't have to wear masks, we don't have to do this? We're It's our, it's the government's fault that the gov that the virus is spreading so much and they can't even share the studies with the public to show them how they could prevent the studies because the studies would show that the government lied this entire time and should have said something. So they're now telling the public health agency Canada, you know, don't, when you make a new study or anything like this, that shows we're wrong. Don't publish it. Uh, just make people have to know it's available and then ask for it. And then we'll send it maybe. We'll send it maybe depending on who's asking. And uh, when we could easily post it on the website and that way provinces can't say, you know, there's no evidence, there's no, there's no airborne transmission and they can't say it's not worth 
having ventilation? Well, it, it, it's frustrating that that the, the the same mindset that's caused most of the problems over the last year and a half is still persistent. Oh, we need to we need to wait for for the evidence. The, 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 this purported evidence threshold is just absolutely preposterous. And I, I can, you know, in, in my jaded mind, which gets more jaded as each week uh, continues, I, I can foresee w- whenever there's any position change, kind of what you alluded to it with the CDC, that whenever the position changes, it, it's like, oh, we could have, there's no way we could have known this, but we know this now. Look at, <clears throat> we have this great new revelation for you. It just, just this it's it, 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 it's a form of of propaganda just you know we ignored it for all this time but oh we we figured it out now and and, and now we'll let you know and i'm sure that's that you know if, if there's any changes made at the provincial or, or federal level in, in in canada you know that's the way that the cbc will finally report on it oh we we have new information now you know now that 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 Teresa tam says it's okay Now we can all use it whenever that will be, maybe in two months, maybe in two years, maybe well after this pandemic's over. And, you know, they they think about it for a while and and planning preparations for the for the next one. And then, oh, we figure this out now. And and anybody who will say like yourself or, you know, like uh, we've seen that, uh, you know, David Fisman. Who's, who's a prominent health authority and 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 uh, professor in in Canada has has been talking about airborne transmission for quite a while and is very vocal uh, uh, about it and is maybe you know the most prominent um, scientist in 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 Canada uh, discussing this. You know they'll they'll, they'll ignore all that and it, it'll just be finally when 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 the bureaucratic body brings it forward, then it becomes access. Ex- um, uh, acceptable in just this this mass scale gaslighting. So, you know, none of this is is too surprising, but it's it's maddening and it's it's depressing. Now, I'm wondering, on an individual level, like uh, like like you mentioned Joe Vipon before, and when I talked to him, like he, if if I'm remembering correctly, like I think his hospital in March said you didn't even need to wear any mask. I'm thinking that that's correct. And then just for wearing a mask and going against that hospital's policy, he got suspended. <laughs> and, and and so like now, like everybody's wearing surgical masks. Let's say a doctor in Toronto, you know, shows up to work on his or her own accord and wears a, a P100. Can they do that? Like, is there any way to, to, to modify this at the individual level so, or, or will they, they, they get thrown into the ditch if they did something like that? So the problem is it's different with every hospital in, in long-term care home, because since the government hasn't explained that these are safe and recommended, some hospitals will allow, will allow them, but then some hospitals will actively prevent them from using them because they'll think they still think they're dangerous. They don't know what's recommended. And they say surgical masks are what the government recommends. So this is what you need to wear. And so unless the government goes, you know, there's this great tool we can use to prevent the spread of the virus. It's called an elastomeric respirator. Um, and it gives equal or better protection than N95 and they should be used. Hospitals will continue to actively prevent it because there's still misinformation on the government website. The government still hasn't taken some of these websites down. So sometimes if you just look at like a health candidate that says, okay, don't use these elastomeric respirators because they have an exhalation valve and they're dangerous. But then if you look at the, and if you look at the Ontario health guidelines, the latest ones tell you that you can cover the valve, but the ones uh, they didn't say to cover the valve until December 21st, even though in October they came out with uh, picture guidelines for healthcare workers to use in long-term care homes that showed how to cover the valve in their guidelines. So why did it take, three months for Ontario Health to then update their guidelines online to let the public know how to do that. And why did, didn't they say, you know, we were wrong all this time to say it was dangerous when it could easily be covered. Uh, please let your hospitals know that they can be covered. And if you need to cover it, you can use an exhalation valve. But then worst of all, the CDC in December came out with their studies to show that even uncovered the exhalation valve, there's, it's still safer for patients then if a healthcare worker was giving was given a surgical mask and then was infected because the surgical masks have these gaps and it's easy for the air to go through the gaps but an 
isolation valve, it doesn't just go through the, through the valve, it has to go through different materials. It ha and then uh, it gets compaction and it, uh, it doesn't go just out in the environment, often it can be directed and it's a lot less virus particles. But we're still giving the surgical masks because that's what we're familiar with. And even in H1N1, the US government was telling healthcare workers not to use surgical masks because they were dangerous and only last resort and that N95s had to be used. And in Canada, during that entire time, they were still saying surgical masks were safe and to use N95s. And then the WHO said uh, N95s are surgical masks. But during H1N1, we're only recommending surgical masks because the poor nations can't pay for all these N95s. So the only thing poor nations can really afford is that's going to be effective or somewhat effective is a surgical mask. Canada is not a third world nation, but unfortunately we act like it, especially when it comes to protecting our healthcare workers. Yeah. And we, we act like it electing brain dead idiots to office too. We're, we're, we're doing really good in that regard. Now you mentioned misinformation too. And it just, when it comes to the press and um, the, the, the government, the, the, they, they talk a lot about, about tackling, you know, misinformation and, and quite often it's the most low hanging fruit. They, you know, they go after the, the one in a million people who are think that the, the vaccines have microchips and something like that. Hmm. But, but yet the, like, as, as you, as you mentioned, that they're putting out misinformation Absolutely. so much of, of what they're like the, the biggest, and it, you know, it, you know, somebody would hear it and you know, their, their initial reaction is, is that we have, you know, tinfoil hats on, but like the, the biggest sources of misinformation are coming from these people. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, they're so concerned about misinformation. Just most of what they've done is misinformation. You know, well, we need to, to flatten the curve. Well, that's a great long-term plan. <laughs> you know, let's not wear a mask. Now let's 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 wear a mask, but we're not going to say what kind of mask. Oh, you want to wear a good mask? We're going to tell you not to wear that. Please wear the shittiest mask. You know, healthcare workers, you don't you don't need a you don't need a very good mask. It's just it, it's it's an, it's insanity. So, ha have you been um, in touch with with? Uh, any other uh, members of the opposition or anybody else in government as of late, like the, the most recent thing that you, you communicated me with was, was uh, Ryan Turnbull and the promising. And then, as you mentioned, that went South and, you know, as like, there's, there's not an election for, for anybody outside of Canada, there's not an election set uh, right now, but you know, the speculation is that there will be one in the autumn, which is completely will be a hundred percent a, just uh, you know, a a distraction and sidestep away from the, the pressing issues at hand for the the be benefit of the the federal liberal party, and that's all it will be. But there, there's concerns about that, and so of course you know that's motivating him to to shut up about you know actual important issues because the prime minister needs to work on his posturing campaign. Uh, maybe get some nice new socks. Now. Have you been in, in touch with anybody else in government actually had like very, very recently and had any uh, actual reactions from them? Uh, a little bit. So I tried to reach out, reach out to the PC federal PCs again, hoping they can call out the liberals about this because they should be interested because it's taxpayer dollars shutting down our economy and things like that. And yeah. also to let the public know that cloth masks weren't safe so we could protect businesses in that way, we don't have to lose jobs and things like that. Uh, now, I've been saying it for a while. They, they've they said that they were going to bring it up to the chain of command. Uh, just yesterday, I was talking to Jim Burnett, who's the deputy, who was Aaron O'Toole's deputy campaign manager, as well as Christine Elliott's leadership campaign manager as well. And he wow. also was Kevin O'Leary's leadership campaign for Conservative Party in 2017. Um, and he said he's going to bring it up. Uh, but he's not an expert. I also spoke to, um, sorry, I'm trying to find their, their names. Uh, Valérie Assouline, who is the um, vice president for the Conservative Party of Canada. She said she was going to let bring it up and it was concerning. I also talked to Jamie James who is the communications manager at the Conservative Party of Canada. These people kept saying it's going to be brought up to the chain of command, but they've been saying that for a long time as well. 
And this is after I showed them the CBC investigation as well. Um, now I called a lot of different politicians in office and the only one that called me back was Mike Manta, the MPP for Algoma, who is the same writing as Carol Hughes. Now it was his assistant that called me back and she said, she said, uh, uh, Mike should be, is going to be trying to call me personally to talk to me about this and to email her the news article and things like that. So I did that on Monday and I haven't heard anything yet from them. So I'm guessing Mike talked to Carol and it's not really something that they want to bring up right now uh, because it would make his partner, his NDP partner in the same writing look terrible since she was the one who got the Canadian government to look into it. And then in December, in November, refused to ask for the misinformation to be corrected, refused to speak out about it just because she assumed there was no longer a PPE problem in Canada. Um, even though the week after or a, a month after she then started promoting a N95 manufacturer in her writing that started making them and said, this is going to help solve the pandemic problems. So she's fully aware that there's these problems going on, but for some reason it's not worth letting anyone know, and even though at the same time she was saying not to let anybody, or it's not worth letting anybody know. She wrote, she wrote a social media post about how the government failed at the start of the pandemic and somebody should have spoken up, but nobody's spoken up. And it's really important to have accountability for, because the government refused to speak up about these problems that were ongoing that they knew about. So it, it, it's kind of interesting when she's saying the one thing, but then the thing she's complaining about, I'm asking her to say something, but she said it's not even worth bringing up to let anybody know what's going on. Uh, so I don't have any faith that politicians are going to say anything until it's exposed by the news organization. And then they're going to be like, oh, you know what? It was mm -hmm. Ford's problem. Uh, we're just opposition parties. We don't know about it. We're not scientists. How are we supposed to know that this problem was going on? Because that's already what they're saying. Like, I, I've got people that were emailed Carol, Jamie, and the other people. And then they say, you know, we, we brought this information to the government. We, we let the government know. And the government's not doing anything. But so if you know the government's not doing anything, then why aren't you speaking up about that? Especially if it's been a year since they've not been doing anything. Like, what are you waiting for? Your opposition critics. Are you waiting for till all the healthcare workers are dead before you're going to speak up for healthcare workers? It, it, it's such a simple thing to do. And it's not something that's beyond their reach because these are things they normally do. They criticize, they recommend, they advocate. But when it comes to something that they were involved in, and they know the problems more better than a lot of other people, they refuse to do anything, but then they blame Trudeau and Ford because they're the people in charge. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see, I guess, what happens with the, your prospective correspondence with the, the federal Tories. But, you know, I, I, I would lean towards that you're going to get as much reaction as you have from everybody else, which is surprising because you think, you know, that they have an uphill battle. You know, it's since they, they've lost, you know, some of their votes to the, the, the startup PPC and that, you know, they, they, they have so they say they have that hurdle to climb, it, which is going to affect them in, in a lot of their close uh, uh, constituencies. And then but they, they, they still have are quite a ways behind uh, the liberals. And you'd think that they'd want something to, to hammer on them to say that, you know, look at there's this been this governmental negligence uh, that that is. A, you know, harmed healthcare workers, and B, harmed the public, and C, you, you'd think they'd really ride this one has, you know, affected the economy of Ontario, but that you know, you'd, you'd think that would be a big one for them. So maybe they're worried that you know, if they expose this, it's not only going to make Justin Trudeau look like the asshole that he is, but it's also going to make Doug Ford look like the asshole that he is. And, you know, I, I, I would imagine there's, you know, a close working relationship between the, the federal Tories and the, and the uh, government of Ontario as there would need to be. So possibly that's the reason that they're, they're going to drag their heels on this one. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Have, have you tried to get in touch with any opposition in, say, uh, Quebec or in Alberta or anything of that sort? Uh, yeah, I, I forget who it was, but I think someone like the Bloc leaders and the politicians and uh, Quebec politicians as well. Uh, but nothing like they, they're not getting back to me. They don't seem interested or they'll look into it and then nothing happens after they say they look into it. Or they say it's somebody else's job. It's not their job. They're busy with other things. 
<laughs> busy, busy with, with other things. Yeah. And that politicians are good at that. Not, not worrying about things that matter. Yeah. It's, uh, Quebec is a, a funny story because they actually bought 80,000 elastomeric respirators from uh, a Quebec company but they're not being used because they're not letting the public know they're safe. So they're just sitting there and Quebec healthcare workers are still using surgical masks. And sometimes they get N95s because they're supposed to, but the elastomeric respirators are just sitting there and there's 80,000 of them sitting there. Has there been, so you mentioned like before with, with, with a lot of the, these, these manufacturers that they're all sitting. So is there, and in the last episode, we, we went over this in, in great detail. Since then, has there been any movement uh, of, of the supply from any manufacturers anywhere in Canada to get the, the actual masks out? Or is it still just, it, are they all just stuck behind the wall of red tape and then we just import from, from you know, Seoul and Shanghai? So the only company that really has any support is 3M. Uh, all the other manufacturers that's not 3M haven't had any support. And one of the reasons is because both the Ontario and federal government heavily invested in the new 3M plant that was supposed to get uh, N95s. And so they signed a five-year contract with them. They signed exclusive rights. So they're, they're just getting the N95s, but they're not looking at elastomeric respirators and they're still not getting the N95s in numbers they should. Uh, because they still say surgical masks are safe enough. Uh, now, while Canadian companies and U.S. companies are ignored, both the U.S. and Canadian government are still buying a lot of Chinese PPE, like the KN95s, but more than two-thirds that end up making it to the U.S., uh, they're either counterfeit or they don't pass U.S. standards. And even a few weeks ago, Lloyd Armbrust was in the New York Times about this because the New York Times wrote about how China was dumping these masks on the American market, and despite the pledge to buy American, uh, they're not buying American. So all these manufacturers are going under and nobody's interested in, uh, in supporting the U.S. manufacturers because they could save 10% by buying the Chinese masks. They don't realize that that money they save is not worth it because it's less effective and they don't actually work. And since more, more than not, they're, they're counterfeit. So they're going to end up spending more money on the fallout from, these fail, from this failure uh, but nothing's being done. The U.S. a few weeks ago, they, when the New York Times started looking into it, they then may said uh, to start buying uh, N95s instead of KN95s, but they only updated their website. They didn't actually promote it. So they just made it. So when people would look into the regulations, it would look like the U.S. government actually did something. Um, but it's still not being done. So a lot of manufacturers, I think within three months, there might be only 20% of the manufacturers that were around six months ago. So you mentioned that two, like I, I've talked about this with you before, and I've talked about this with Aaron Collins and like there are any, you, you've sent me a bunch of, of information on this. And yeah, there, I've seen that there's like particular, you know, mask brands or whatever they are, the, these generic masks coming from mm -hmm. China. Like there's certain uh, types that are, you know, faulty or just absolutely completely useless. They're just, it, like the, the the numbers that they do from the tests are just appallingly low, um, and then there's some that work okay, but it's two thirds of yep. the total amount of masks that got brought into the U.S. are are the the these uh, faulty knockoffs. It's it's so, it's so terrible that CBC Marketplace in March they had an investigation because they looked at KN95s that were in uh, pharmacies, major retailers, and online. And even then they showed a lot of them failed and they were counterfeit or they didn't pass standards. They're, they're supposed to be at least 95% effective and some of them were only 20% effective. So, and these are major retailers that are selling them. And even Lloyd Armbrust, the president of the American Mass Manufacturers Association, he did, uh, he bought a lot of the Amazon uh, PPE that says they're 95% effective and 40% of the PPE sold on Amazon doesn't even pass standards. So, and, and if you're going to a pharmacy that you trust or you're going to Amazon or these places that you trust that they did their due diligence to research these companies before just buying them and offering them as a protection from the deadly virus, that they would immediately take it off their shelves or say something when uh, they're found to be defective, counterfeit, or 
not passing our standards in Canada, but nothing's being done. And they, the reason that they're doing this is because they don't know that they can buy N95s from Canadian manufacturers. They don't know they can buy elastomeric respirators because these companies can't even advertise they have them. And they think all there is available is KN95s because there's, they don't know that there's dozens of Canadian manufacturers. They don't know there's over 50 U.S. manufacturers. So they get whatever they can get their hands on, <coughs> even, if it's a, even if it's a real risk. All right, so let's step away from Canada and in the U.S. for a second. Actually, first, you mentioned uh, that, that information out, out of Finland. Was that a, a study, or, or what was that exactly? That was from uh, a newspaper. I think it was Helsinki Times. They uh, were reporting on it. Okay, and, and was, there, was there anything else in there? Uh, so I'm trying to think. So they had 80 cases of the Delta variant they found in the country. Seven out of 80... Uh, had already passed away by the time that article came out. Um, there was four to five people were partially or fully vaccinated. They realized surgical masks weren't as effective as they once thought because of all the people that caught viruses. They talked to uh, experts and they showed that uh, the spread happened in schools as well from the healthcare workers that got infected. So it started another cycle uh, going into the school system. So it shows that uh, not only can students become infected, but they can be big sources of transmission as well. And um, it shows that the vaccine, while vaccines are great and everybody should hopefully get theirs, it's important to get both shots. And it's also important to realize that just because you have the vaccine, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, give you full immunity. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not an equivalent of PPE and making sure you're fully stay safe, you have to combine both vaccines with proper mask use and then things like ventilation as well. Because if not, we're just going to end up seeing all the uh, all the cases going up with people that are vaccinated and people who are vaccinated are going to assume they're not getting sick, so they're not going to get tested. And then a lot of people are going to end up spreading it to others that way. Absolutely. That's likely to occur. Well, it's just a matter of, you know, to what degree. Um, so uh, abroad, like let's say in the EU or maybe some of the more uh, independent countries in, in Europe, Switzerland or, or Norway or Central America or South America, is there any, have you heard of any sort of changes in mask and respirator policy anywhere else in the world that are getting ahead of this nonsense? So yes, uh, the UK is looking to move to N95s and elastomeric respirators. They call them FFP2s and FFP3s over there. Okay. Uh, but currently, elasto any elastomeric respirator with an exhalation and valve is prevented from being used in the UK. So they don't tell them that they can be covered. They just don't use them at all. Although there's, um, there's a company called Full Support that just bought Design Reality and uh, they're, they're a great manufacturer. They have a healthcare worker version. And they're right now the only one that's technically allowed to be used in the UK. Um, there's other countries, I think Thailand or some of the ones that had really great successes at the start. Often you'll see pictures of them in full hazmat suits and you'll see that they have the full face elastomeric mm. respirators. Not just, the, not just the half face, but it covers their eyes as well. So one of the reasons why these countries are so successful is because they take every precaution as you should with a pandemic. You should it shouldn't be a wait and see approach. And then when you see your pro when you see your your side is wrong, you keep going with that anyways. It's right away we need to ensure we have the best protections available for everyone. So they they you're not going to see them around cloth masks. They're, you're going to see the healthcare workers with elastomerics or N95s at a minimum, and even places like China. They, they had a lot of cases the very first month, uh, but then in January of 2020, they actually switched to N95s and then they became uh, a lot safer and the spread wasn't happening among healthcare workers. They only represented one in 20 cases. Well, in Canada, it's one in four or one in five. And Mario Possum, I even explained that to the Canadian government when he presented uh, in front of the House of Commons committee, he explained that China, uh, we could see how bad are Canada's response by examining what China did, we see that Canadian healthcare workers are using surgical masks. 
they represent one in five cases, which is three times higher than the global average. But then China is four times higher because they have 5% of their cases among healthcare workers. But most of those cases happen before they implemented the N95s. So it goes to show how N95s will actually reduce cases. And there's a study out of Finland, uh, which showed that healthcare workers that were in the highest risk settings like ICUs, they were given N95s and none of them became infected while wearing N95s. But the ones that were in lower risk settings, of the hospitals, because we thought there was no danger in those areas, uh, they were given surgical masks and they had a 63% chance of infection. So it shows that there's a lot of knowledge about surgical masks not being used, but for some reason, news organizations aren't picking up on that. The government's uh, denying that this is going on. So people are continuing to suffer and people keep using the PPE that doesn't work. And then the public on top of that, they get upset because they say, well, you know, you're telling us to wear these cloth masks. You're telling us to wear these surgical masks and we're getting infected. So how, why can, why are we going to trust you? Because when you told us we're going to be safe with these things and we're not being safe, then maybe we won't use masks at all. It's not going to make a difference if we're still getting infected. So it's a double-edged sword. It's not only that better PPE is not being used, but when, they see their PPE is not effective. They often don't use it at all. And and can you blame them? And like so many people have have, have focused, you know, such a large amount of their ire upon you know people in the in their community who are you know quote unquote anti maskers, and in, instead of looking at you know the the source of the problem, the, the the government as as much as you know they those who are just opposed to all masks. I don't really understand their position that well. It makes more sense to go after uh, the, the, the source of so much confusion. Now, let's take like that. I'm not sure if it ever got published or not, but there was that the, the, the so-called Danish study uh, on on masks saying that masks have you know, just such an in, infinitesimal amount of effect by you know, studying uh, ma- people wearing masks, and not wearing masks in, in Denmark. And it's not surprising because you know people in public are going to be wearing surgical masks or cloth masks and then so those who are opposed to masks you know they 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 are not looking at it with the right mindset because they're not taking consideration you know that factor that it's you know these crappy masks and not all masks are equal but you know people will look at that and say well why am i wearing these masks and i don't blame them and then there's no pushback from above saying that well, you know, if you wore a better mask, because they're also avoiding the topic of wearing better masks. So those who are then opposed to masks will jump on it. And and there is merit in their argument that's saying, well, you know, they, they, they make it so general that it's like, well, masks don't work. Well, that's incorrect, obviously, for, you know, for, from well, my position and your position. But where there is so much truth is that the general mask agenda has such little effect in validity and, and it's, it's, it's accurate in that, but yet, it, you know, it, it, and then, then so much of the division then just gets left down at the public level where, you know, those who are, you know, wearing the, the cloth mask get to you know yell at the people who don't want to wear a mask and, and vice versa. And then it's just a, a, a big mess that that just solves absolutely nothing. So now I, I would imagine, like you 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 mentioned just a, a couple little instances where there's you know changes happening or you know, not in in one case not changes but just better policies from the get go, and then you know it looks like some changes uh, apropos to the, the United Kingdom. But I would imagine that a whole bunch of the world isn't going to change until the CDC does because so much, uh, so many other countries, including ours sort of look to the, the, the CDC and, and, and to, and the, the Americans in general. So would you imagine that, you know, there's not going to be a lot of more widespread changes until, you know, the, the CDC and the U S government and the world health organization make a, a lot of changes on their end. It's hard to know because sometimes the changes they do, they make it so nobody knows about these changes, so they never actually take hold. So they might make changes, but if they don't tell the public that they made these changes, like how are we supposed to know? It's it's just like when they, they first admitted that it was airborne. Okay, well, it's good. Now promote airborne precautions, but they still not promoting airborne precautions despite admitting they were wrong for over a year. 
So what's the point in quietly updating a website to say all these things that you said we shouldn't even try and take the precaution of, you're completely wrong. But now instead of taking the precautions, knowing you're wrong, you're going to keep using the precautions you know aren't safe, even though you've now admitted that you were wrong this entire time. So it, it's one thing to, for the CDC to make changes. It's another thing to make sure that they're actually implemented and listened to. And one scary thing is, you know, surgical masks, there are ways to make them more effective. You can use something called a mask brace and that'll help seal the surgical mask to your face. So if you're using a surgical mask mm. that is made of polypropylene, like the same materials as N95, that'll give you essentially sort of like an N95 um, protection because it will seal to the face so there's not going to be gaps. And this is something they could have easily given to healthcare workers or general industry say, you know, if you're going to use surgical masks, use a mask brace. There's no dangers to using a mask brace uh, because it will give you that airborne precaution. So no matter what the debate droplet versus airborne, you're good. You're good for either. But we're saying use surgical masks. You don't have to worry about the, the seal. So people are walking around with air, just gaps and stuff like that. And now when you're in a room sometimes working on a patient for 20 or 30 minutes and you see with the Delta variant, it takes seconds, it, it's going to create chaos and it's going to, it's going to have a de devastating effect on, uh, on the future of the vaccine's effectiveness. Because another problem is people with immune, prob uh, system, immune problems, they don't necessarily have the effectiveness of the vaccine. There was a great CNN article from a month ago where it shows somebody was tested after receiving both doses of the vaccine and they didn't have any protection from the vaccine. And then it was further looked into and it was realized that up to 60 million Americans or 15% of Americans might have little to no uh, uh, protection from the vaccines, but they're going to assume that they have full protection. So they're going to take the risk and they're going to take off their masks. And, you know, if they're already immune compromised, that's going to be devastating for them when they do get that virus. And on top of that, there's an LA Times study that showed uh, an HIV patient from South Africa. They were mm. positive for eight months because their immune system couldn't get rid of the virus uh. and it had 13 mutations. So we're not protecting the third world right now. We're only protecting our own asses. And despite how we keep saying, oh, the third world's important, we need to make sure Canada and the US are, are important players and we protect those in need. They're not sending them the vaccines. They're not sending them PPE. And a lot of manufacturers are ready to donate their PPE and they just need help from the government and to get it there so that they don't end up giving all their PPE away and then go bankrupt because they have no more PPE to sell to Canada or and have to spend for shipping to get to Africa or South America mm -hmm. and all these other places. And so we're completely abandoning these countries. And that's where a lot of the mutations are going to end up coming from. So we saw it, there's already some from uh, India. Uh, there's one from UK. There's one from Brazil. And there's one from South Africa. And there's also new variants of the Delta variant. There's a Delta Plus now in yeah. India. But I believe it was about a month ago, they realized in Vietnam that there was a hybrid of the UK and Delta variant as well. So we're, there's hundreds of millions or billions of people in developing nations. They're not going to get the protections they need. They're not going to have the PPE they need. They're not going to have ventilation protections. And we're not even giving them the vaccines. And when they do get the vaccines, Canada is looking to give them the vaccines that we won't give to Canadians. So if they don't give them to Canadians and people are afraid, the people in these countries are already, they already don't trust a lot of Western civilization or Western na nations for good reason. And then they're going to be like, we're not going to take risk our lives to take the vaccine that you refuse to give to your own people. We'd rather take the risk of not getting infected than getting all these problems with the vaccines. So we right. need to make sure that they, they get the Pfizer vaccine, that they get Moderna and all the good ones. And, and it's not just the, one, the ones that are throwaways and disposable for Canada. And we need to also make sure that we protect their healthcare workers because in these places, they can't, they can't afford to lose their population. They already have so many problems with drought and economic problems. They, they can't afford to lose their workforce to long-term long issues such as brain damage, heart issues. And, and kidney issues and heart issues because they don't have the hospitals and the treatments to do it. So while we're lucky in Canada that we might be able to survive on one lung or two lungs, and these people aren't going to be getting double lung transplants in, uh, in these countries. They're not going to be getting all the help they need. So it's going to be devastating. There's going to be 
people losing their, their families. And then there's going to be people that don't have parents. Uh, what little economy they have is going to be crippled. And then there's going to be more things like wars between these nations because they can't afford to, to keep going with the way they are. So they're, <clears throat> they're going to have to find other ways to support themselves. And that might, need, that might mean having to go to war with a neighboring nation to try and get the resources they need to, to survive. Yeah, just ge- general, you know, e- e- when the economics go bad, uh, it, it, it makes any nation more susceptible to internal or external conflict in, in general, for sure. Uh, like you, you mentioned that, that, that I, I forgot to ask you about this before. You mentioned that, that double lung transplant. Who, who was that again? Who, who had, it, was, it was a healthcare worker in Ontario? It was a healthcare worker from uh, the Roberta Place outbreak in Barrie. Um, okay. I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, uh, and he was pretty young as well. And there were, there were workers from that home that died from that outbreak as well. And I think 128 out of 129 residents got infected as well. And, yeah, and then what was staff. it like? And then like 80 of the residents then died out of that, something like yeah. that. And Edwin NG is his uh, name. He spent uh, five months in the hospital fighting for his life, life, and then uh, finally he was able to get his double lung transplant. Jesus. And this is right beside uh, another hospital in Barrie, Waypoint, where just a couple of weeks after that outbreak, there was uh, healthcare workers that were begging on social media for PPE from their local MPPs because there was a deadly outbreak at their hospital and they ran out of N95s and they didn't know of any other options. So the Ministry of Labor came and the Ministry of Labor had to let them know that elastomeric respirators were available, recommended, and went above and beyond N95 level recommendations because they didn't know any of this. So they could have prevented the outbreak from happening had, had they known that from the start and had the government distributed the respirators that they admit themselves and their workplace inspectors admit are better than everything else up to date. Uh, but the government's decided to, it's better to secretly fight the unions in court than to give them the PPE that can actually make, keep them alive. So, and, they, and because they won't even share the recommendations to use them, hospitals have to find out from word of mouth that they're safe or from ministry inspectors. But it's already too late by the time they find out from the ministry inspectors because people have already died. What are the specifics of these litigations? Um, so I'm not too familiar with all the ones. I know there is one with the Ontario Nursing Association they went to court, I believe it was in uh, the Kingston area back in December. Mm-hmm. I was able to convince the Ontario, Nurse, an Ontario Nursing Association lawyer that it would be worth to confront the Ford government and ask for these last American respirators, and I gave her me, my resources. And then the court case started on December 23rd, and then on the 30th, she told me that the government decided to settle the case. So uh, I believe the result was before forcing... Um, expired PPE on healthcare workers and possibly even N95 reuse, but I don't even think it was that they would then let them have elastomeric respirators, but only, only because it was expired and stuff like that. They weren't giving them uh, the respirators and then they continued to go in court. And I even remember watching one of their court cases, I believe it was a month ago, they had it on zoom. It was the arbitration where there was two lawyers going against uh, the government. And I was listening to, the three, uh, the three judges that were asking questions, they were asking simple questions about, uh, for example, in Europe, they have widespread use of N95s in certain countries like Germany. And the judge said, you know, that would be great Can, if you could show me an example of that. But like, that's, that's great evidence to show that it's important to have widespread use. But you didn't show me any evidence of any of this going on in these countries. And they didn't say. So I, w- I remember emailing as I'm watching. And then one of the lawyers told me, like, you know, everything's already in. We can't talk about anything else and all the things that the judge was asking for. Like I had the resources and they were easy to find it's and it's stuff I already gave the union, but they didn't mention it at all. And then they lost their court case against the government and they even had to pay twenty five thousand dollars for losing the case. That's absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. Oh, now. So like you mentioned like that, that the healthcare worker with the double lung transplant and like before you're mentioning like just in general, <clears throat> healthcare workers getting very, very ill and dying. 
and or just some wanting to leave the occupation. Um, and and I, I've heard about and and like Joe Vipon talked about that before in in Alberta, not so much with, with colleagues dying, but with them just throwing in the towel and, and not wanting to work anymore, not wanting to work in Alberta. Mm. So in in some of the provinces where it's been you know bad for for extended periods of time, particularly Ontario and Alberta. I, what what I've been you know worried about since you know well past in, in last year is it's not just like the the immediate impact on on the 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 healthcare system because like with so many people who have had a lack of concern it's like well you have to take care of this beforehand because if you let it go it's going to overwhelm the healthcare system and then you're going to be pushed into a position where you have to deal with it anyway and that's what happened in this last wave where is just there was just it, particularly in, in Ontario this time, this this was their round to be the the, the absolute embarrassment of the country, and it, they didn't want to deal with it until it was too late. They had doctors flying in from Whitehorse and Newfoundland, like the poorest places in the country, and it, it was just an absolute disaster. And so if you and, and like in in dealing with with the prospect of maybe at some point in Canada looking towards some sort of elimination strategy, my my biggest concern was, you know, arguing against myself was, well, how are they going to shut down the the uh, Ontario Quebec border? And then they ended up having to anyway. Both both provinces, dis, you know, decided that well, this needs to shut down. It's like well. You know, you get pushed against the wall, and you figure out a way to do it. So if you do it beforehand, you know you you have to implement you know the the hard uh, measures, but you know for a shorter period of time and, and without all of the fallout that comes with it. So you know you you keep pushing it back, keep pushing it back. You're gonna get to a point where you have to do something because the hospitals get overloaded. So anyway, that's where so much of the focus is: is the hospitals get overloaded. But what what I'm worried about too is, and and you mentioned this also with with the cancer screenings, etc. What are the long term, like not even like year, two years, like the next decade? What are some other problems that we might see? And uh, are you already starting to see anything as far as just? the secondary health costs of not just cancer screenings, but, you know, any sort of appointment and assessment of any uh, possible onset of, of a disease coming on, you know, people not wanting to go to appointments, not even just because, you know, they can't because everything's so backlogged, but because they think, well, you know, I just don't want to go to, the, yeah, I'm just, you know, limiting my, my, my quantity of interactions. And so I'm not wanting to, to go to the doctor, you know, compound that with the fact that maybe we're going to have, you know, less doctors too, because, you know, maybe some are going to move out of the big centers, whether that be Calgary or, or Toronto or Montreal. And they, they think, well, maybe it's better if I had a job in, in, in Yellowknife or Moncton. And, and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't my, my, the first place where I'd want to work before, but now, you know, Moncton and, and, and Charlatan and, and St. John and, and, and Whitehorse and Yellowknife are, are, are looking like a lot rosier places to work. Maybe that's not the case, but I, I would suspect that that's happening to at least some degree. So, you know, with, with doctors moving, quitting, or dying in big centers at the time when the healthcare system's the most overloaded and so much um, other medical practice has just been pushed off and pushed off for just a crazy amount of time now. Like if it was six months uh, of this, that would be terrible. Now it's been what 15 months or, or whatever now. So like, have you heard about anything really accruing as far as damage in that regard with you know, some hospitals really losing a lot of staff? Or that that the 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 balance book of, of people dying from you know other health procedures being put off or are starting to stack up or or anything of that sort. Um. So I, I've heard a lot of, from nurses. Uh, they've told me they're either staying in the profession just to help out their colleagues and stuff like that, and because they, they feel it's their duty. But once the pandemic is over, they're going to be looking for other lines of work. Uh, I've had others who said that they've gone to complain to their unions, for example, five times that they're actively being prevented from using their own elastomeric respirator 
and told they have to use the surgical masks, even though they're working with COVID patients. And they said, you know, after the fourth or fifth time we talked to these unions and they won't even mention or help us, we're not going to keep bringing this up because every time we bring it up, we risk getting in trouble uh, with our hospital and, and then get targeted for speaking up. So we're just not going to speak up anymore. So a lot of problems are not going to be known because people are tired of speaking up because they're speaking up, but no one's listening to them. Um, and then when you look at, for example, uh, people that are suffering from uh, from long COVID and stuff like that, that people are starting to even, uh, they can't live with themselves with the with the new with the new virus or with the long term effects, so they're mm-hmm. killing themselves. And yeah, there's a, a director, yeah. yeah, Nick Guthy. Uh, he's a writer, director, and producer. He he just lost his wife. His lost his wife got sick last summer, and she couldn't take it anymore. So she took her own life. And I see. And that. you know, yeah. it's gonna be it's gonna be sad because it's actually gonna be a lot more common than people realize. Like the UK showed a study where thirty percent of the out of 48,000 people that left the hospital had long-term effects uh, of COVID and 30% alone was just the lung issues. Like I, I'm one of those people that are still suffering lung issues from getting sick. And then when you're, you look you're, at your, your lungs still haven't, because you, you mentioned that last time we talked, your, your yeah, lungs they, are, are they, have they gotten better good. at all? Have they, they gotten better got, all since then? They've got better. Um, I've been on different medications and after the lung specialist uh, put me under and went into my lungs to take a look and, and he saw like the, the growth on the wall and like the, there's blood coming from the walls of my lung. Uh, he gave me uh, a medication that helps with like COPD. Uh, and that has helped a lot, but I still can't do things like run. Uh, a lot of activities I can't do. I got to be careful because uh, I have asthma. And the tests I did, like the pulmonary function test show, I don't even have uh, anywhere near what a, a bad asthma would be because it's so much worse. So I got sent for CT scans and now... I'm going to see the specialist again in three months and he might take a biopsy of the lungs because he took a scraping when he was inside the lungs. Uh, and it showed that it wasn't cancer, an active cancer or anything like that. But he's, he said he's never even seen uh, the lung issues I have. Like he said, he, he first thought it was bronchioexcesis, so severe scarring that affects one in 20,000 people and it's a lifelong disability. And then after seeing the, uh, the CT scan and going inside, he said, you know, it's maybe localized bronchioexcesis, but he's never seen anything quite like it before. And this is a lung specialist. It's not, you know, a family doctor. This is a lung specialist that looks at the lungs. And he actually specialized. He did a lot of like research and gave presentation presentations on bronchioexcesis. So if he says it, to him, it looks like that, then, then this is going to be a serious issue for a lot of people. And I'm not the only person having these effects. A lot of people are having these effects. Uh, so you know, a lot of people might not be able to live with these problems. If they have brain issues, they might not want to live with these brain issues. They have heart issues. Now, Canada is not too bad, but if you look at the U.S. where they don't have medical coverage, they're not going to be able to get help for this. So it's going to be a lot worse in the U.S. than it is in Canada. But and, even, and like a higher proportionally amount of people sick. Like proportionally, we, yeah. We, yeah, like we haven't done that much better, but still better. So yeah, there's, there's that health coverage issue, but even proportionally higher amount of, of illness. But even even children that aren't getting the virus. So the Toronto Sick Kids Hospital, they often get children from Canada around the world, and then they treat them, and they fix the problems that if weren't fixed, they would be lifelong problems. And sometimes they only have a certain amount of window because these are children that are growing, and you have to fix the problem before they get to a certain stage. And because of the virus, uh, I believe it was in November they came out with an article saying two thirds of children have missed their surgery windows because there's so much backlog and, and they have to shut down the hospital. And I think they were, they were even getting adults to the sick kids hospital. Cause there's not enough, uh, there's not enough beds in the regular hospital. So they had to use sick kids as well for adults. So Jeez it's, Christ. it's going to be, it's going to be a problem. And then you have cancers, but then if you have a surgery, let's say you have to have a knee surgery or, or a hip surgery or things like that, where it might more normally have been six months, you might be waiting for two years. So you might not be able to walk for two years. You might be in pain for two years and it's going to be a big problem. And then that's if we have the same amount of doctors and healthcare workers to treat it, but we're going to be losing it. So it's going to be a compounded problem right. and it's going to be a snowball effect. So it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And people are going to see, realize, you know, once the stories come out saying how 
the government knew for a year that it was airborne and refused to speak out and told the Public Health Agency of Canada to make it hard to ever find these studies. And then how nobody spoke up, politicians refused to speak up about things like elastomeric respirators from every party. They're going to lose faith in their elected officials. They're going to lose faith in their unions. And they're not going to want to stay to be doing their jobs because if there's another pandemic, and which is likely there is, they know that they're going to be facing the same problems. We learned from our mistakes in SARS. We learned the importance of N95s. They might not have known uh, quite so well about elastomeric respirators, but they knew right away it was important to be take the precaution to give every single healthcare worker N95 at a minimum. But they're still fighting for that, even though now the government's admitted it's airborne, they're still fighting for the precautions to be used. So what's the point in a four-year uh, national investigation where you're just going to ignore the findings of the investigation and then tell all the experts when they bring it up that all these experts are wrong and then only finally a year later say, you know what, the experts were right, but we're not going to take the precautions that you said you should have taken anyways. We'll just, we'll just say that it's now happening, but we're not going to take the precautions. So it, 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 I think so many people are going to lose faith that it's going to be a mass exodus from the healthcare doctors, healthcare workers, just the regular hospital workers. And they're fighting for pay. They're fighting for workplace safety because often nurses are at high risk of violence and things like that as well. And they have all kinds of mental health issues. So there's a study that came out. I think it was about uh, half of the healthcare workers that were studied uh, admitted that they were thinking about suicide mm -hmm. during the pandemic because of how stressful their situation. They, they don't know if they're going to go to work and they're going to come home and infect their children or their spouse. They don't know if they're going to get infected at work and be dead two weeks later. And then their children don't have a parent. And physicians and were, were, were already more prone than the mean of the population to, mm -hmm. to suicide beforehand anyway. And it's just going to be worse and worse. And, you know, if they, if they see their coworkers, their families passing away, they see there's no help coming from anybody and not even journalists care enough to investigate these problems then they're going to feel abandoned by everyone. That's why it's important that we that people support our healthcare workers. It's important that we support our essential workers, our warehouse workers. These are essential people. They're, the reason why they had to work is because they're essential. So it's essential that we should make sure they have the best protections and that they're not ignored. But often only healthcare worker unions know elastomeric wrestlers are even safe because they're not talking about it publicly. The only time the Ontario Nursing Association decided to have a Facebook post about it was in March, one week before their uh, annual elections. And I was calling them out uh, during the elections. And I said, you know, you should ask your leaders for the entire year why they're not asking politicians to help with elastomeric wrestlers and why they weren't even using social media to bring it up. And then a few days later, they have a post just on elastomeric wrestlers and their reports but they don't do anything besides issue that post before the one week uh, leadership. And then that's the only thing they ever talk about, but then they, they're silent. The, ND, the CBC investigation should have made all the unions cry out together. You know, why is there no accountability? Why is still nothing being done? Why are people dying? And politicians aren't even saying that there's other options available that can keep people alive. The unions don't care about anybody but themselves. And they want mm -hmm. to make themselves look good as well. So mm -hmm. they'll try and do things to make it look like they're, they're actually helping, but they refuse to take simple steps. Like how hard would it have been for the Ontario Nursing Association to come out in September to say, it's been three months and the government's refusing to give elastomeric respirators and they, we have 100,000 available and we can prevent the second wave and we can make sure no healthcare worker gets infected. But that's not done. And they argue for things that the government has very little of N95s and they refuse to even talk about the other problems because everyone's only focused on N95s because that's what's familiar. So it's, it's, uh, it's such a weird situation where there should be safeguards in place, but the safeguards that are normally in place with opposition critics and things like unions, those safeguards have failed. And I don't know how we're going to be able to bring those safeguards back because nobody wants to admit they, they were wrong and that their mistakes cost people their life. And I think another issue is, is that, you know, those who are gatekeeping the information or making the decisions, you know, the, those in unions, those in, in the press, you know, various writers, uh, all the government officials, all these bougie pricks, you know, they're all, they all get to work at home, not like the people in who have to work at, you know, the, the Amazon warehouse in 
Brampton or wherever and they have to, you know, work so they can get their packages to their door, the people who work at the supermarkets that, that, that are accommodating them. So all, all these people and most of their family all are in the same situation. So they don't have the effect. And I think it, it, it seems like they don't give a shit either. And most of these they, people it, are minorities too. And, and they don't yeah. seem to care about minorities. Like, Oh, they do nominally. You know, when it gets well, to the say, point, you yeah. know, the, you know, the, those who are those who are the writers when they get pushed or the politicians, when they get to have their their nice, you know, time to posture and say all the, the right fashionable words, then they care. But in reality, they don't give a shit. And, and, you know, they're the ones who are passing forth what is the proper information and who are making the decisions. But yet, you know, they don't have any skin in the game. They don't have there's no direct impact on them. And so it's easy to see how these things uh, keep perpetuating through that way because there's there's no effect on these people. Yeah, and even uh, at the start of the pandemic, Korea was sending uh, N95s to uh, to Canada to the veterans for as a way to thank them for the work they did during the Korean War for the sacrifices they did. These are people that are 80, 90 years old, mm-hmm. but instead of distributing them, the Canadian government uh, refused to even let the public know because they didn't want to have embarrassing questions asked by Justin Trudeau. Oh my so God. they just, you have got to be fucking post. kidding me. So it, it, they, they would rather let their veterans die than to give them the N95. So they don't have to, to apologize. I did not hear about that one. That, that, that doesn't even sound, well, I believe you, but it just, it's, it's so immoral and just, you know, bereft of any ethical compass that it just, it, you know, it, it fractures belief. Yeah. Okay. You sent me a link here. I'll, yeah, that, I'll, I'll, I'll be sharing, I'll, I'll be sharing that on, on Twitter today. Fuck. So that, they're that more afraid of amazing. optics than they are of deaths. Oh yeah. These people are just vile. And, and that's the thing. Like, so the problem is there, when you organizations report on something, Often it used to be like there's a major story. It was talked about by all the other major news organizations. But now the CBC says something. It's not picked up by the other ones. And then it, there's no follow through. So all these big problems, they get ignored by the other news organizations. So nobody knows about it unless people like us talk about it and actually go looking for it. Yeah, that, that's another thing, too. Like we, we, we've mainly been been shitting on the CBC. And I, and I think we've been even too nice to them. I, I, they're what how they've conducted themselves to this is just morally reprehensible but yeah where's 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 the globe and mail where's the national post what are what mm. what are they, what are they doing shit even like why isn't even the 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 toronto sun like they have they they too have an opportunity to to you know throw some some pies at at uh monsieur Trudeau. um it's 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 excruciating. Well, let, let, let's move on to that. Um, it, it, you you mentioned that you you uh, started to get some inroads into the, the press in the states. Perhaps are you able to talk about that at all? Uh, I guess I could talk about it a little bit. So Dan, I uh, I was interviewed by Dan Diamond from the Washington Post last week. Uh, Dan Diamond is, in my opinion, one of the top uh, journalists in the U.S., especially when it comes to COVID. His reporting actually uh, last year sparked congressional hearings and some of Trump's top appointees, like uh, I believe it was Tom Price, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, the equivalent of Health Canada, had to resign in shame from Dan's investigation. So while, while I was researching the problems, I had already shared for a while that the CDC presentations from 2017 and 2019 showing the CDC was fully expecting N95 shortages to happen fully was supposed to warn against the danger of surgical masks unless no other option existed and also to go to elastomeric respirators. But the new information I found was I also found the SARS and H1N1 studies, or not studies, the recommendations from the CDC's own website as well, where it said in 2003, you know, use elastomeric respirators, avoid uh, face masks and surgical masks. Same thing in 2009. And then I shared those online and then people like Kimberly Brothers and other people shared that. And I sent uh, Dan the email with all the different links and he was actually surprised. And he was actually surprised that nobody else had reported on it yet. He was even saying uh, like, he thought if, if I put some of the tweets out, 
other people might pick up on it and he'd lose the exclusive. So it'd be harder to convince his editor to that it would be worth looking into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I told him, like, actually, no, like some of these things have been on there for months. The journalists, they, they don't seem to care. They think it's only a story on elastomeric respirators. And they don't realize it's a story about accountability, how we should have went in one direction with the pandemic, but the government lied to everybody and they went in a complete opposite direction and it's still not even talked about. And there's no, there's no accountability. There's no investigation. And these problems should have been easily caught. Like how many people were looking into the CDC recommendations? How was it that I found these doc, these problems and nobody else did? So he spent about uh, an hour interviewing me last week. And then he was going to interview Lisa Brusso. She's one of the top experts in the world on elastomeric respirators. She even wrote things for the CDC and Sri Shalakanda. He was the lead researcher for the Allegheny Health Network. And he was in charge of that trial for the American College of Surgeons with the 2000 health workers. So these are two people that are supposed to be uh, interviewed. Um, I, Lisa reached out to me, I believe it was this morning, and she hasn't uh, been interviewed by Dan yet. So I'm not sure when his investigation is going to come out. But he's busy with a lot of investigations as well. Like he's come out with three investigations in the last few days. And uh, so I'm not sure if it's going to take a week or a couple of weeks, but it, it's going to be, it, hopefully his editor doesn't think it's just a mass story, another mass story. It realized it's more than just that. It's that we could have saved 3,600 healthcare workers in the U.S. We could have prevented the trillions of dollars of economic damage. We could have prevented most of the outbreaks in the hospitals. We could have kept businesses safe. We could have kept every single city open had they known the tools that were effective instead of being misled to believe that surgical masks were somehow safe despite knowing it wasn't and refusing to let them know the tools that they've had recommended for over 20 years. So... Well, between I'm really, even beyond the healthcare workers and like to, to, to show the scale of the economic damage, like you could have saved at least hundreds of billions of dollars and you know, in between the U.S. and Canada, hundreds of thousands of lives. If if these policies would have been changed, like even give them leeway, even though they, they should have uh, been less ignorant to this early on and even before, like even say if they would have made the policy changes 11 months ago, which is mm-hmm. too which is too late but you know, much better than now. Like the, 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 the amount of damage you know, in, in health, lives, present economic damage, and, and that of the future could have been circumvented. Or just tell the public the truth. You know, There was no need to try N- reusing N95s when it was shown to be dangerous and it had never been done before. Instead of saying the only options N95 were used, you should say instead of reusing N95, use the N95s you had available. And then if you don't have enough available, use elastomeric respirators because they are made to be reused. They are recommended by the CDC. They have been used for past pandemics and they're available from dozens of manufacturers. So there's never, there would never be a need to reuse these N95s because that was another point of concern for healthcare workers, both stress and mental health, but also their straps break. They, when they get, they get chemical burns from some of the things they were using, um, then the depending on the disinfectant, it could lose the efficacy, the efficacy of the uh, the electrostatic charge that's built into the N95 that helps attract and trap the particles. And often they were getting back these N95s that are discolored, that are yellow instead of white. And some hospitals, were, like in Chicago, were using them for two months at a time. So it, it's such a dangerous situation where something that has never been done before that is proven dangerous is used and what's proven safe, what's proven effective and what's proven is readily available to prevent the other problem is not even mentioned at all. And, uh, and even now, the, even in Canada, there's still N95s being reused. It's been April 9th since the U.S. said not to reuse it, but there's still hospitals that are still reusing N95s in the U.S. because guess what? Letters sending letters to a hospital and hoping it makes it to the right person and up the food chain in the hospital is not an effective way to make sure the hospital actually learns that they're not supposed to reuse N95s. And in Canada, they're not even talking about the PPE shortage being over. They still think there's a PPE shortage. And they think that's why healthcare workers still need to use surgical masks and N95s because they don't know that the shortage was declared over months ago. Yeah, I never heard about that either. I never thought about that. That's just incredible. Because yeah, even if you can't, the healthcare worker, it's like it's better to have a KF94 or a KN95 
which you know you can you can they're 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 so easy to come by even like mm-hmm. the the box like i i, I checked out my the k95s so about four with the information that you sent me and they're one of the better ones i think the second best one there at costco and they're they're they were cheap when i first bought them they're even mm-hmm. cheaper <laughs> <laughs> it's like like, you, like it, so it'd be better if if it, like these healthcare workers like yeah too, many of them should be having the the uh, p100s but like it'd be better to have a kf94 or a kn95 and using like shit like use three a day mm-hmm. than yeah. having than having to use the same n95 for whatever it is i'm assuming a couple of weeks or something absurd like that like, and just because they, they they can't relay the information no, they, they can't relay the information and they don't care what's available because, you know, for them, if they say certain things then people are going to look into it further and then if they look into further, then they realize they made a lot of problems and that something should have been said before or what they're saying is actually misleading and it's not truthful. So it, it, they, try and, they try and make it so that anything that's negative is hard to even know about and anything that's positive in a little bit, they, they do a media circus on. Mm-hmm. So it, it shows that they, they, it's all, it's all political theater and it's not really about society or anything else because what's preventing Biden from having a press conference to say, you know, we just bought 375,000 uh, last American respirators um, a couple of weeks ago. And that's actually from a Canadian company called Dentec, but they also operate in the U.S. They, Dentec has a healthcare worker version, and I believe it was the second one approved by NIOSH. And the, the U.S. government just bought 375,000 of these respirators from Dentec. So that's a major announcement. Why can't Biden say, you know, we now have these respirators that are safe, they're good for healthcare workers, and we bought 375,000 so that healthcare workers don't have to struggle? Why can't President Biden say, today's a good day? We, the PPE shortage that was causing so many problems around the world, it's now over. We now have so many N90, we now have 300 million N95 sitting in our warehouses, but because they refuse to say anything at all, they sat there for months and months. And since they weren't being used, these manufacturers decided to donate them to places like India so that at least they'd save lives uh, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't just be collecting dust on warehouse shelves. So, but even then when the U S government, uh, learned that these manufacturers were going to send it to India. They're like, oh, you know, if you give it to the Indian government, we'll ship it for free for you. We'll help you out. We'll make sure it gets to India. But then the Indian government said, no, we don't want these. We don't want 100 million donated N95s. Uh, So manufacturers then had to find uh, NGOs in India. And the U.S. government's like, no, you know what? If it's not going directly to the government, we're not going to help you get it to the people of India. So it's not really. Why why did did the Indian government not, not reject them? Well, there, there's a few things, and this is just uh, speculation okay. of why they did it. Uh, but they were upset with the U.S. because the U.S. had ingredients they needed for vaccines to make their own vaccines in India that they refused to give them. So they were upset because this was right before the outbreak. So a lot of people in India could have been protected had the U.S. given them the vaccine ingredients they needed. Uh, but then they're also saying that they're self-reliant on PPE. And they even had, I even saw a news article about a month ago where they now say they don't have to worry about uh, uh, PPE from other countries and 95 from other countries because they can make 30 million in India a month. Now, <laughs> 30 million N95 is when there's over a billion people in your country. Uh, that's 3%. That's less than 3% for can use an N95. So you're going to 3% of the population using the same N95 for a month is not really effective. Yeah. So, but then they would have to admit that they didn't have enough domestic capacity. So it's, they don't want to admit because then it's a national embarrassment. So they'd rather let the country uh, look terrible in the world's eyes because of the spread of the virus and all these people dying and people floating in the rivers because they came in. There's not even enough uh, places to, to cremate them because a lot of times it's cremated. So they were cremating the, the crematoriums had to cremate people in the parking lots. They would normally have the most they'd have, for example, in one place was I think in, in their 80 year history was 150 people or something like that. And they were getting more than, than that by the morning, by the time they'd open up, they'd have 150 bodies. Mm -hmm. And so people can't afford it. So they'll dump the bodies in the river. Uh, They're just, or they're burning them in the parking lot and things like that. And then there's other problems. Like for example, 
there's a secondary infection um, with black fungus, That's and that right. leads to a lot of people dying where they might not have died either. And then well, they had the oxygen dying or it, 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 you know, I think probably 90 some percent of the ones who don't die are going to be are horribly disfigured or mm-hmm. you know, have serious problems. It's brutal. And, and that's a thing. Like, so if the U.S. government, their goal was to help the people of India, they should have helped them find the NGOs. I didn't I shouldn't have gone with like Abra Karan and Lloyd and these other people to find these NGOs. Mm-hmm. Um, and we shouldn't have had to find places that can ship it or I think Lloyd even paid out of his own pocket for some of the flights to go to India uh, so that they can donate it. So the U S government has these planes. They could easily do it and it could have prevent, you know, if we prevent the the spread in India, that means those people aren't going to spread it to other countries, which will then go to the U S because you know what, your borders aren't closed. People are coming in from other countries. They're coming in from India and they're bringing these viruses in. And so if you don't want the virus coming in your country, then why don't you make sure it doesn't get to your country by preventing the spread in other countries? But that's not their focus. And even uh, in uh, even when they they finally made all these announcements about elastomeric respirators and they said healthcare workers don't need to use surgical masks or now banned around suspected or COVID suspected or confirmed and how elastomeric respirators have to be used with N95s. Uh, they didn't make an announcement with that. That's a big announcement to not have to wear a surgical mask in the U.S. where, you know, that should have been CNN front page news, but Kaiser Health News and a few other places picked it up. But a lot of people didn't even know about it because they're not, they don't make any kind of uh, announcement except for updating websites because they would have had to say surgical masks used this entire time was bad. And because they're not saying it, people don't realize that this changes are happening. So healthcare workers are often still have to use surgical masks because their hospitals don't know these changes have been made. So we're not living in 1820 where it could take a year for information to get across the country. We can update a website. We can hold a press conference. There's called, uh, you know, a White House press briefing. Uh, and that can easily be done. Tell them the PPE shortage is over. There's these things called elastomeric respirators. There's dozens of manufacturers that have them available. Uh, there's dozens of N95s that manufacturers available. And, you know, you use, if you're going to use surgical masks, get a mask brace. There's companies that make mask brace, so it's easily to get a mask brace. So you can actually make the PPE effective instead of using something that you know is ineffective. But nobody's speaking up. So people don't like to call out their own team. So, for example, news media on the left don't want to call it the liberals or the NDP. Right. They only want to call it the PCs. And now right. in the U.S., Biden administration's taking over. You know, they're happy to talk about all the problems with, with Trump happened. And they're so definitely much, a lot so worse much of the, Trump. the left press in the United States, like Trump's been gone for how long now? They still just want to talk about him. It's pathetic. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I was hoping like Fox News or something would criticize the Biden administration for these problems as well. But they're not talking about it because then they would have to say these problems were even worse under Trump. Uh, so they can't call it the Biden administration. Well, so, they're 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 good at lying and, and spinning bullshit. So they could they could, you know, in in, in their mental gymnastics, like still they like call out the Biden administration and just just ignore, just like edit out that part of that period of time in the Trump days, <laughs> and then just and just pretend that you know the pandemic started on the twenty first of January. Yeah, like now they're saying Trump was really hard on Putin, but Joe Biden is soft on him in Russia. <laughs> so. It's, it's kind of weird, but even when you look at things like uh, when they audit the problems and things like that, and they look at, into all the problems, the Long-Term Care Commission for Ontario, for example, or the Auditor General in Quebec that talk about all the problems, they don't even mention the word elastomeric respirators in any of their reports. So how come the Auditor Generals don't even know that these respirators have been available and could have been used and haven't been used? Because that's that would be important to show in a report about why all these problems occurred that there's there was enough protection for four to five healthcare workers in Ontario, but they didn't get it. And it's not like the commission didn't know because on December 16th, Mario Possumai even brought up the fact that the failure to use elastomeric respirators in his, inter, in his testimony to the Long-Term Care Commission. So they knew about it, but they didn't include that in their final report at all. So that should be concerning that even commissions looking into it somehow overlooked that there's something besides N95 and when there's 200 pages and not a word mentions of elastomeric respirators, that should be alarming for a lot of people as well, because 
if the if they're looking into the failures and they don't know that one of the reasons that there is all these failures because there's respirators that are not being used, then how come they're not getting this information? Are they are they just not looking at it, or people not letting them know, or are they refusing to talk about it? So it's hard to know what's actually going on because when people look at the mistakes, they don't even know all the mistakes that were made. They only know part of the mistakes, and then they make assumptions based on the little information they have, and those assumptions can often be wrong. Now, one thing I think, too, that's going to make where I, I, I have less faith that as far as, as individuals, except for individuals, like, like with the endeavor to, to get um, masks to, to India through the, the, the NGOs and all of that, where, where I, I just have little faith that, that anything is going to get any traction, is just that uh, the, the the press have, have have one good thing that they get a, they have one thing that they get a report on you know daily and, and and they can grant all their attention to, and then there's one thing that the health authorities and the governments can you know use uh, to to talk about, and even the opposition that they've been doing this for a while, and that's the vaccines. And so they can, all the other problems that are still problems, you know, regardless of, of the amount of, uh, of uh, antibodies that are nicely being spread around through the, the vaccines, um, that the, the, this, is, this is the wall they can put in, can put in front to, to not discuss anything. So with mm-hmm. the government, they can talk about the vaccine rollout. And, you know, whenever there's an uptick in vaccines, oh, geez, you know, well, X company is giving us, 27 million more in July this week. Hooray for us. And then the opposition, you know, so they can make it cheap and easy, you know, with, with, with their, their, their partisan bullshit, they can focus all why didn't, you know, uh, you know, the premier or, or the prime minister at this point in time, get more vaccines at this month at this time. And why did they screw up this delivery of this week or why aren't we getting more of this vaccine? And, and that just seems to be all of it. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, it, and, and they, they can just keep pushing aside uh, the, the attention of, of everything else, uh, no, no, no matter what that may, may be, including the, the very important issue that we're talking about with respirators. And so I just have you know, very little hope that in in at least the next couple months or few months that there's going to be much attention granted to it uh, on a wide scale unless you know something starts from some little seed like you, you you're talking about with the, the the Washington Post writer that you know maybe something will stem from there and can grow from there you know that that has things like that have occurred but other than that like the the, the the governments and the opposition are just going to focus on the vaccines and then that'll be it and they don't need it they can just avoid everything else and even if they they get you know a question about something else they can just push it aside ignore it and talk about the vaccines some more and you know we've seen that the cbc is the the propaganda arm for the prime minister and so they'll, they'll just keep following that um are, are you as as cynical as i am on, absolutely on yeah. um I'm actually going to try after after the after this podcast. I'm going to be reaching out to uh, more smaller independent ones. Um, there's uh, a place I found out called the Rabble. I think it's called. Uh, that, yeah. So I'm going to reach out to uh, one of their reporters and see if they these people can actually look into it and see if they can also get these politicians on record because these politicians when it's finally going to be public, they're going to be saying, oh, well, we weren't scientists. We didn't know. Or how would we have known this problem was going on? And nobody was telling us this was a problem. Or we, we didn't even know uh, we should have said anything. No, they're going to blame each other. And then nothing's actually going to be done. And it's not, it's not even the first time Canada has actually recommended elastomeric respirators. I found uh, in the recommendations that came out from SARS in 2004, uh, and it was a document from the British British Columbia government about the pandemics, the next future pandemic. And they were even saying, I think it was on page 22, they talked about both half and full face elastomeric respirators. And they even mentioned how the Texas Center for Infectious Diseases was using them since 1996 for tuberculosis. So this is not new information to the Canadian government. And then in 2011, after H1N1, the Canadian government still has on their website the 2011 
uh, PPE guidelines that came out uh, after H1N1. That's and it right. says use elastomeric respirators. Yeah, you sent me that. I, I forgot all about that until now. Yeah. And e even IPAC, what we rely on, in March of 2020, they came out with, uh, I think it was a 30-page study showing the dangers of N95s and how elastomeric respirators should be reused. And somehow that never got mentioned. And then there's IPAC infectious control manuals for places like Peel, Mississauga, uh, Tamiskaming, and all these other things from 2012, 2017, 2018, 2019. And they say, they even admit that elastomeric respirators are good for droplet and airborne protection. So this silly argument that we need surgical masks because it's droplet and we don't need elastomeric respirators because it's not airborne, it, it is just negligent because you, they know that it could be both. And they should know that anything with a gap is dangerous. Anything that fully seals is definitely better when it comes to like anything that could float through the air, but they're not even saying anything. And they're, they're trying to get people to be scared of elastomeric respirators. So they're, they still haven't even said that they're safe and they're not dangerous for patients. And they still haven't even admitted that there are some that have clear communication that can be easily used. So people will see, oh, if it's impossible to communicate, that's probably why they're not being used. So if it's dangerous for patients, that's probably why it's not being used. So all these assumptions get done. So even when journalists look into it, they'll see, oh, actually the government says they're dangerous. It's not worth looking into further. If the government says it's dangerous, that's good enough for me. Like, who is this person I've never heard of before trying to bring up this, uh, these things called elastomeric respirators, right? So it, 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 there's so many things, even in 2013, WorkSafe BC came out with their studies on elastomeric respirators in a healthcare setting. In, in British Columbia and so many provinces, healthcare or paramedics are using elastomeric respirators. So it's not like these provinces don't know elastomeric respirators are useful because paramedics, a lot of paramedics are, have switched to elastomeric respirators. Right. And they're often, when I spoke to Mike Sutherland in November from the Manitoba Nurses Union, yeah. he was yeah. telling me that the reason why healthcare workers in Manitoba were not getting elastomeric respirators is because the Manitoba government said there was only enough for police officers and paramedics. <laughs> And that they cost too much. So, so and, and, and I gave him the resources and he was going to bring it up and try and make changes. But I haven't heard anything from Mike since November and I reached out to him. I haven't heard anything from that union. Uh, so I don't know, I don't know what, what's anything's been done from that union. But I do know about a month ago, there's, I think it was from Manitoba, there was a young nurse in her 20s uh, who got COVID and she didn't even make it to the hospital. They, they found her, they found she was dead in her apartment. Jesus so, fucking Christ. So a lot of people, well, well probably the, like, sorry to cut you off, Nick, probably like a lot of these nurses, you know, when, when they're the, you know, that generally healthy and dying, they, 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 these people have just been work there uh, like crazy for over a year. So they're, 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 they're probably like uh, not eating well, they're yeah. fucking exhausted. Just probably shitty immune system because of that. Yeah, they're 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 just got hit by a, a fucking truck in general in their life. So yeah, they're gonna get COVID and they're they're gonna get a bad exposure, and they're they they they're gonna be it, it, it's gonna take so little to to you know make them severely ill or, or dead. It's is and the new like the I'm not sure if it was a Delta variant or what, but I know even in Toronto uh, a month ago they were talking about how there's over 30 people that died at homes and didn't even call 911. Like they, it was so the, it, it got so worse so quickly that you don't even have time to call an ambulance and you're, you die, you die at home. So how, and this is a nurse, so she should have known symptoms and stuff like that. So it shows that it's, it can take a quick turn and you might have, you might have minutes sometimes, or uh, maybe an hour to get to the hospital. If you don't make it to the hospital, you're, you're going to die because you need that ventilator. You need that system to pump the oxygen into you. Uh, because if you don't have oxygen, you're not going to be able to even talk on that phone to make that 911 call. If yeah. you're passing out from the lo loss of oxygen, you're just going to pass out <coughs> and then you're just not going to wake up. So it, it's so concerning that there's so many people dying at home and they're not even dying in hospitals. And then if you die at home, they might not assume that they're dying from COVID either. They might assume that they died at home from a heart attack or they died at home from a stroke. And then they don't actually test for COVID or these different things. And some of these people, uh, they, they said they, they didn't even have symptoms. Like they, they just all of a sudden died. So yeah, if the, per, it, if the person's going to be like, let's say 60 and this happens to them, 
um, you know, much less people much, much older than that. Yeah. They might not even look into it. It's just, Oh, they're Ooh. just they're like, and if they're like maybe 50 pounds overweight, Oh, they just had a heart attack. And, and that's it. That's that. And even like, uh, even with the Delta variant, like they, they said, uh, they announced a few days ago that at least one person in Toronto, I think it was Toronto area died fully vaccinated. Alberta, there was a hospital outbreak. So where they're using surgical masks, but if had they used N95s or last American respirators, no healthcare worker would have got infected, but fully vaccinated healthcare worker got infected, got seriously ill. And one of the people he infected a patient was fully vaccinated as well, but that patient died. So it, it shows that these places that are, are saying, don't worry about PPE because you're vaccinated. It, it's just negligent and criminal negligence. You know, it's your, it, it's the duty of these people to inform uh, what they need to stay safe. And if they're actively saying to PHAC and the, like uh, to not give, make these studies public so that nobody knows, they know people are going to die. If they, if they know that these respirators are needed, but they're not going to say anything, they know people are going to die. And so it's their duty to inform. It's their duty to let the public know this is going on, but they're not going on. And nobody's calling out these politicians. So it doesn't matter which party it is. Uh, it's going to happen. And then whenever whenever it's going to be found out, everyone's just going to blame everybody. And then there's not going to be any accountability either because no one's going to know who to blame because everyone's just going to say, oh, it's the province's fault. It's the federal government's fault. It's the party in charge. Oh, I'm the party in charge, but you were involved and you didn't let me know. So it's just going to be a blame game and nothing's yeah. actually going to change. Nothing's going to be happen where we're going to change these protections. And that's only going to happen when they're forced to address it. Like every time I got the CBC to try and talk to the, or news organizations to try and talk to the government, often the government refused to even uh, answer any of the reporters questions. They refused to say why they weren't being distributed, why they weren't promoting their use. And the CBC is so, so stupid. Like in Sudbury, the, I contacted the CBC in Sudbury to t let them know that the government was refusing to let them know or let the public know. And you'd think that the failure to, for the CB or for the government to get back to let them know after four weeks is evidence of it happening instead of saying, you know, if the government's not letting me know that they're refusing to let anybody know, I can't write a story because the government's not letting me know. Well, that's why you're investigating this. And there's other ways to prove that information is going on because First of all, you can look up the Ontario Health recommendations. You can look up the Health Canada recommendations. You don't have to have a politician confirm it when it's on their website. And when you have your Radio Canada journalists who covered that as well, and then we can, you can Google uh, elastomeric respirators and see the CDC had also recommended them and that a lot of hospitals were using them and that they were used across Canada. There's obviously something there, but no, no, no. If the government doesn't get back to me, I can't do anything at all. Uh, I have to... I have to wait till the government admits that they're refusing to say anything and that being negligence to, to, to look into it. So how often would you say, you know, if the, for example, all these residential school children uh, that they're, they're finding now their bodies, the, the government is not going to really do much about it. They're going to say, Oh, we, we should, we should do things for the, for these families and that, but then they're still fighting them in court so that they don't have to have be accountable. They're, they're fighting accountability. They say, oh, we should do everything we can for these First Nations, but they're not giving them drinking water. They're right. not. That's a big they, one. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not taking care of their health and safety, and they're not helping them get out of poverty and do all these things. And then when when there's a, they try and get accountability through the court system, they say, no, no, we're just going to hire better lawyers than you. We're going to drag it out, and then uh, you're not going to get anything. While did we're you, saying did you, you, did you see what happened today? Uh, um uh, uh, not surprisingly, and and in in like she didn't do it in, in an extravagant way, but uh, Jody Wilson Raybould tweeted out something about the the latest discovery of the gravesite near residential a former residential school. I think actually the one here it was uh, uh, regarding the one here in Saskatchewan, and and um, oh what's her name Carol Burnett uh, or Carol or I can't Carolyn. I can't remember one of one of the the the, the uh, liberal one of the members of the federal liberal caucus texted her you know, pension question mark so in, inferring that Raybould is is you know posturing about you know the, this this serious is the serious issue that un, unless the liberals and the Tories you know brush under the rug you know they'll they'll, they'll pander to the, the problem for maybe a while and then 
not care about it when it doesn't matter anymore. Otherwise, it's going to be a, you know a major national issue for some time to come. And so you know she's one of the indigenous members of parliament, and and it has been talking about indigenous issues for years. And so she she made a tweet about it. And so this um, liberal MP uh, tweets her in, in, in implying that she's posturing to try to, you know, maintain her independent seat that she miraculously won in the last election mm-hmm. after she, you know, not to bore our, our foreign listeners, but got kicked out of caucus by yet another one of uh, Justin Trudeau's many, like she was trying to investigate an actual uh, uh, incident of, of pretty extreme corruption. And uh, she didn't want to shut down the investigation. And so, you know, the, the, our great, holy, wonderful, awesome feminist prime minister kicked out his, uh, you know, indigenous female attorney general so that his blatant corruption didn't get investigated, but she still managed to maintain her seat as an independent. So, you know, the, you know, saying that, oh, you want to keep your pension. So you're, you're posturing about this. And so Ray Bolt just like, uh, 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 screenshot uh, the text message on her phone and and just tweeted it out and so this this you know worthless MP is already like apologizing about it you know it, it shows what kind of people these these people are just, yeah and like just just no morals and, and and like trauma is not just for like when there's trauma that's that large it doesn't just stay with that generation it follows future generations as well and that's why it's important it's not just the survivors, but it's their family members and stuff like that. They're going to be struggling with this for a while. And that's why they need help. They're like, we need to help them. We don't want, we shouldn't be fighting them in court because the Canadian government fucked up. We should be apologizing and helping them out, seeing how can we help you? Like, here's some money to help you guys out, but how else can we help you? Can we, can we, uh, you know, can we figure out a way to get you clean drinking water? So you don't have to struggle for that now because so many people, and that should be a basic right is clean drinking water, especially in Canada. And, and we can't even do that. And then uh, we try and make them look bad for trying to ask for accountability, but they're the ones that have been suffering and there was no reason to, to cause all that suffering. And by fighting them even more, you're causing even more suffering. You're forcing them to bring up the trauma in court. You're forcing them to have to talk about it to their families, to reporters all the time they want to get over this trauma they just want to, to, they want the people to know what they've gone through so that nobody else will go through it again, but they want accountability and we can't get accountability and we can't even get, uh, we can't even get uh, basic dignities for, for first nations in Canada. Mm-hmm. Even now, like we, they, they suffered like a long time ago, but they're still suffering now and we're not doing very much to, to help them. Yeah. And, and it, yeah, like so much of the, the issues stem from just that, you know, they're pushed aside socially for and, and neglected for a long period of time and treated as secondary for a significant period of time. And it's just, you know, even though you stop that, you know, it's from generation to generation, it's, it's not going to resolve overnight. And yeah, you, you touched into some major basic infrastructure issues that like the, the 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 clean drinking water problem that, that there's been some first nations communities that have had but been on boil water advisories for years and that was even a part of prime minister shithead's uh campaign promises was to end all of them immediately and i don't think he's done like half or so maybe less and and so yeah uh, on these problems i'd like to hear a, a lot less apologizing and see a, a lot more action because the the the, the apologizing uh uh, uh, factor is where you can just have these people fawn over themselves and 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 use it uh, to to demonstrate their their virtue to the public. And you know you, you need some degree of apology for sure. It's 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 necessary, but it gets to a point where that that's all that the action is taken and not the the, the real um, changes that that need to be made. Uh, and you could see yeah, that yeah. the government doesn't actually care about them because even when you look at policing, there's so many murdered and missing uh, uh, First Nations people, and their, their, their murders are often not properly investigated. If they go missing, they're, they're not properly looking for them or anything like that. And so there's so many things happen, like Thunder Bay is a, a bad thing for that, and I think Manitoba's mm-hmm. pretty bad for that. And, and northern, northern BC. 
and, and there should be national investigations, national inquiry. Why isn't the RCMP going in and launching an investigation if the if the local government in let's say Thunder Bay or BC or Manitoba is not looking into it? Then the RCMP should be investigating, and they should be investigating the police. Why is it the police treat First Nations women different than they treat all other? murder cases and things like that. And even when it comes to court cases, it's hard to understand what First Nations people go through. So it's not just black and white where there's certain things going on. We have to recognize where they're coming from. And we have to understand that also when it comes to the court system, because often they haven't been given the chances that we have. So we need to treat them with more respect and we have to treat them like they're they're not we can't treat them like second class citizens mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden say oh well we should do something to help them out but then not actually do anything we should make sure that they're valued just like everyone else but that's not happening like it, and it's happening across a lot of problems in Canada the any problems that are happening on reserves they get ignored uh it doesn't it gets underreported on and it doesn't get fixed and they'll keep happening year after year after year with the government saying they want to do something, but it's too hard or they'll do something in the future, but nothing ever end up, ends up getting done. And they wonder why they're upset with the Canadian government, mm -hmm. but it's their own fault. Like the, the Canadian government and even the provinces, they're, they're, they don't look after people that, that need the help. They look the other way and the only time they'll say something is when they're under the microscope. And that's, it's the same thing going on with like the pandemic. They're not going to do anything until they're at, under the microscope. And even then, unless there's accountability at the same time to make sure their words and actions line up, then there's never going to be, there's never going to be a proper response to the pandemic. And we're always going to keep having these societal issues because it's better to say that you care about something and things are so that's important. Right. But when you can't actually prove, when you actually say something and then do the opposite, and no one calls you out for it, then there's no incentive for changes. And that's why accountability is so important. Even it's not just getting the last American wrestlers and N95s to the people. It's to make sure there's accountability for all the people that lost loved ones. You know, they've been fighting for a year for these protections. They're crying. The healthcare workers go to bed crying. They're afraid to go to work. And then, <clears throat> and then, uh, they pass away and then nothing's done. And then nobody even asks for something to be done. So then there's no changes because there's why change if you're not going to be called out. So people are going to keep dying and dying and, and there's people don't even care enough to, to ask for changes. Yeah. And, and the, the, the changes for the, these like uh, needs to start from Ottawa, but then Ottawa has an incentive not to care because they, they, they've, they've seen incentive to pass the buck on off onto mm -hmm. the provinces. Especially and, with you know, an election coming. Yeah, especially with an election. And like even seen, like it, you, you can see it playing out. Like when Ontario started going off off, off, off the, the cliff and, you know, it worked out so well for, you know, for Prime Minister Shithead when, when Nacho Doug was in, was in a tough spot because, oh, you know, he gets to play hero. He gets to, you know, he gets to get on the phone to the, to the Maritimes and to Newfoundland into the territories, into the prairies, asking for for uh, doctors and nurses to get on a plane and and head to to the GTA to help the, uh, with the catastrophe going on there. You know, doesn't doesn't care about um, you know the long term issues or the pre or or preventative measures. It, 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 he got you know at the cost of the general Canadian economy and the economy of, of the province of Ontario and the lives and well-being of many, he got political capital. Mm -hmm. So it works out well for him. So he gets to do nothing. And, and, and it's worked out that way for the whole pandemic is like, you know, pass it off into the provinces. Like he had, he had two throughout this, this whole crisis, two meetings with all the premiers, just like, do you guys want to work together? No. Oh, okay. Oh, I tried. I tried everybody. And like, even with those meetings, like, like how bad the federal government has done, like, let's say Premier Higgs or Premier King, like, I wouldn't blame them for not wanting to have to give up their provincial powers and hand them over to that brain dead, incompetent douchebag when Premier Higgs and Premier King just did such an amazing job 
you know, w- one of the best places in the world for handling the pandemic came out of uh, the eastern part of our country. Like, why would they want to hand off, you know, more executive power to that 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 brainless scumbag? And so like, he just didn't try. And then and then so various provinces at various points, you know, Quebec first, and then Manitoba, and then Alberta, and then Ontario. He just you know collapse, collapse, collapse. And you know he just can you know come in and play hero when he needs to, and just hand out checks, just keep just keep pumping out checks, and and uh, you know ha- throw on the biggest debt load for you know personal and government debt that we've seen since the war, and you know we'll, we'll deal with that later. See how that goes. But he can just he can just he's he's just played hero the whole time, and it's worked out weird. well for him at the cost of everybody. And what's weird is it's like he doesn't think there's going to be like an inquiry or investigation into the country's response. <laughs> no shit. And, and it's the same thing. I, I I'm confused with Ryan Turnbull because he seemed like a very genuine person at first. Like in February, when he even said how appalled he was on Twitter, he publicly admitted that sure it was, he was a shame that Ford was keeping these hundred thousand respirators when the when the Canadian government gave them billions of dollars and something needed to be done. And then he publicly admitted in March how he was bringing it up to the ministers, the importance of lost American respirators, but then I should blame provinces, not the federal government. But then when he sent me private messages to let me know, like, we know damn well the droplet protections, uh, it's not droplet protections and it's airborne protections that we need. He even let me know that he went to an emergency room because he got sick and he saw only surgical masks being used. And he said, like, who the hell, like, makes these, these, uh, these decisions? Like, we, we know we need airborne PPE. And then he told me like he he was because the ministers were refusing to pressure for it or even ask for it to distribute them. And they were refusing to even let anybody know about the recommendations. He told me he was going to try and start an internal letter to get other MPs so he can get finally get forced the hand of the ministers. But that was in April. And that's two months. So he knows the government is fully aware of airborne transmission. He knows the importance of letting them know about Alaska American respirators. And he knows other MPs were supporting him to try and get the ministers but now he's not even saying anything at all and he's not blowing the whistle on his own party so he's pretending to now not know that there's a lost america respirators or that the government knows is airborne but it, it's too late ryan like the, the information's on twitter mm-hmm. even i shared the private messages because i want accountability like he it, he was great like i i, I wanted to so, throw my support behind ryan but when somebody knows a problem is going on and they refuse to speak out about it, despite knowing people are going to die, then that's not somebody who should run for re-election. That's somebody who should be kicked out of government. We need politicians that are going to call out their own party, that are going to be there for Canadians, and that aren't going to be there just for votes. And if they're told, you know, don't bring this up because it's not going to be good for the elections, well, we don't need those people. Like, we, we need to make sure they're held just as accountable as the leaders like Trudeau and Ford and people like Francina and, uh, and even John Fraser from the Liberal Party. John Fraser, in October, he asked the Ontario Minister of Health why she was refusing to distribute the 100,000 respirators. He asked why they were refusing to promote their recommendations to use them. And he was supposed to get an answer by December, by middle of December. But because the Ontario government decided to close a few days early, uh, he told me... It, they ended up getting an extension till the middle of February, but that they were still refusing to answer any of their questions. And then he got like a one paragraph answer the very last day they had possible. And the Minister of Health said, you know, she didn't explain why they were distributing them. She just said hospitals were aware they were available. And then for the part where why aren't the public knowing about them? She said the public's too un- uneducated to use them properly. So she she'd rather let people die using cert- using cloth masks because we're too uneducated to use elastomeric respirators mm-hmm. when a lot of the people using our elastomeric respirators are people working in the construction industry, mining industry. Well, most and- of the people who wear them are working in construction. The only people yeah. I know like who wear them are in mining. Like there's a mine a few kilometers that way from my house or, you know, I have a, bunch of friends who work in construction and they all they all have a couple exactly those those are the only people i know wear them so it's it's all blue collar people and why not let the public know just what's available and what's safe not just not make their decision for them 
because the Ontario government already admitted that the reason they weren't recommending uh, face masks and stuff like that at first is because there was a shortage. So they admitted that they misled the public to believe that there wasn't a need to wear the masks. And only once they got caught later admitted it, that they misled it because of the shortage. And so now it's because they don't want the elastomeric respirators to be used. Like there's so many people that could have been saved across Canada and so many jobs could have been saved too, but we're too stupid to know how to use it. So, and John Fraser, somehow that didn't even get any kind of response. So his team, Eric Osborne, his assistant sent me that, uh, sent me that letter. And then I put it on Twitter. And even then John hasn't mentioned anything about elastomeric respirators then. And it should be concerning that it took four months for the government to send that one paragraph response that we're too stupid to use them and that hospitals are aware. Yeah, but that's, John, that's nothing, that's nothing new. That's, that's the same thing that, that, that Lord almighty Teresa Tam said in April of, of 2020 was that we were, we were too stupid and useless to use surgical masks. So it, it mm. stand to reason that we're much too stupid and useless to use, to use a, 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 a re, an elastomeric respirator. But then they'll go out and say, you know, your cloth mask needs an extra layer and put like paper towel or something in between. That, that's what we're going to recommend. And we're, you're too stupid to use a, an elastomeric respirator, but we're going to let you reuse the N95 for two or three weeks at the time. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, you it, mentioned paper towel. Like if it's all just droplets, like why don't we just wear paper towels? Like, yeah, like, like let's just, let's just get, let's just make a red green mask. Let's just get a bunch of bounty and some duct tape and, you know, if it's just droplets, then, you know, that, that should be all we need. And where's the alarm bells? Like uh, Australia announced a week ago that they had a case showing it was an infected person that was driving people to the airport and he walked around a, a, a mall and just walking around the mall, he infected, I think, four or five people within seconds of just walking by them. So if you're walking by someone and you can infect them, that shows it's airborne and it shows it doesn't take 15 minutes because right now the CDC says, you don't even need to get tested unless you've been around a confirmed patient for 15 minutes. Well, this is really seconds and it's not droplet. It's obviously airborne. If you could just walk by somebody uh, casually and they get infected, then how come in, if oh, you're he in must have been somebody, spitting on yeah. everybody had to have been <laughs> and, walking and, around. And you're, when you're a healthcare worker working on a COVID patient and you're forced to use a surgical mask, you're not, you're not six feet away working on that patient. You're right in front of them working on that patient. And they even admitted that it's not even AGMPs that are the highest risk uh, problems because they said coughing produces 20 times more virus particles in the air than does the AGMP. So it, it just goes to show that there's so much information that's being kept from the public and it's so easy to, to let them know the truth and to actually just say, you know, here's what we know, uh, here's what's available. You know, if we don't think there's enough available, then this is what we recommend, but don't lie to the public. Don't tell them that it's not airborne when you know it's airborne. Don't lie to them, tell them their cloth masks are going to be safe because there's a shortage and you don't want them to use N95s. Just tell them that they should be reserved for healthcare workers. So until there's enough for the public, that's what we're going to do, but don't just lie. And then the public has a trouble trusting the government because the government has lied so often. And when they get caught, they don't apologize. They find an excuse about why it was important to lie to the public. And then the lies go on. And then the public doesn't believe the government when they talk about vaccines, effectiveness or safe or things like that. Yeah, and it doesn't help. Them? Yeah. And when the government and things like the journalists, especially like the CBC go and say, you know, AstraZeneca is too dangerous to use. Don't use it at all. Uh, and then the week later, they're like, no, it's perfectly safe. Go ahead. Use it. And then a week <laughs> later, they're like, it's dangerous. You know, we recommend don't use it. And then there, and then another week goes by and then it's uh, safe and dangerous, safe and dangerous. Like, how how do you keep well, going from one direction thing that to I, th another? I think is is gonna uh, it might not arise it might not be a problem but like I, they with AstraZeneca like a few people had had blood clots and so well we need we need to stop with those but now like some some teenagers are having heart problems with 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 Pfizer, Pfizer and yeah. with Pfizer and Moderna and you know so if 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 you're just you, somebody who's who's kind of weary of the whole situation just in the in the general public and you see how much lying and get and uh and, and obfuscation and misinformation has come from the government and then this weird double standard with vaccines i i you know, i wouldn't be surprised if if vaccine hesitancy starts going up instead of down like it was mm -hmm. kind of going down for a while some people weren't un unsure and then 
you know, and then you know, wide scale and smaller scale campaigns to try to convince people otherwise what's going on. But maybe it'll start going the other way. And, you know, it, and then it's going to be just like the masks, like some people out of their own piety are going to be focused instead of, you know, looking at who's been, you know, just lying to the public and confusing at the public that, you know, they're going to shit on their neighbor for, you know, making different decisions than they are and then looking at the root core of, of the problem as to why, you know, so much of the public does have some reasonable distrust, even though if I don't, you know, agree with what they have to say in, in, in particular, or really understand, you know, the, how they've, they've fully reached those, the, the, every specific conclusion. But uh, so I, I could see just like with masks that, that, that start having the vaccines, people, you know, get mad that some people aren't taking vaccines. And then just instead of looking at the confusion, they just, you know, like shit on their neighbor and, and Hey people, like if you're doing that, like we live in a society, we have to live with these people. You know, it, it, we, we're, we're all in this together. And so if you're just going to get, you know, if, you, if you're just going to, you, you, you know, throw uh, all your anger at people in your community, you know, really, what, 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 what is that helping? You know, when you, know, you can find where, where the real problem's coming from. So, yeah, I, I could see that happening yeah. in the future you know, with the confusion. With, with and there's going to be a lot of countries upset with Canada and the U.S. too, because... Like if you look right now, Canada and the U.S. are focusing so much energy to try and uh, blame China because the virus came from China. Mm -hmm. Now, with all the resources they have looking into China, how come they didn't see all the healthcare workers are wearing N95s and they don't have healthcare workers aren't getting infected because they had N95s for a year and a half? How mm -hmm. are they missing this? Like, China, wherever the virus came from, if it came from China or somewhere else, it doesn't matter. The virus is there. We still need to protect it. We, we shouldn't be blaming China. We should be looking at the countries that were effective at stopping the spread. And China is one of those countries, Korea and, and New Zealand, and looking at them for examples. But we're just trying to blame them. And then when the public finds out in other countries that the U.S. and Canadian government knew they should have let the public know about elastomeric respirators, and they didn't. And had they known, other countries could have also known to use it as well. So there's a lot of countries in Asia where everybody, it's not political, everybody just wears uh, surgical mask or protection, even sometimes outside of pandemics, yeah. because yeah. Yeah. their neighbors are important. You know, everybody's important. It's not like a me, me, me society. It's a society is about respecting everybody else. Um, so they're going to realize, you know, the Canadian Ontario or the Canadian and US government, had they let everybody know, like these countries would have been able to buy our N95s, would have been able to buy our last American respirators. So our manufacturers wouldn't have had to go under because these other countries could have bought them and sustained them until our Canadian uh, government started letting businesses know to use them. But we're losing manufacturing to all these countries and we could have ramped up productions. There, there's some manufacturers that can produce a million elastomeric respirators per month, but they're capping their production at a hundred thousand because they can't sell any. So it, it it's such a, stupid game to try and blame other countries when the mistakes are happening are happening in your own countries and at the fault of our own politicians and we should be working as like a together with every country we shouldn't be blaming one country or another we should be like hey what worked for you what didn't work for you you know let's try and help me out what do you have that you you need maybe i can help you out maybe i have some resources for your vaccines maybe i have ppe that can help your people and businesses you know, what do you have? Oh, you have the material that we need to maybe make the mask. Oh, that's great. Let's work together. So that way everybody has more masks and we can protect everybody. But it's blame, 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 blame without actually doing any of the fixing and without mm -hmm. actually doing looking at what works and trying that. It's just deflect, 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 blame everybody else, but not ever make any changes. And then if you're caught, well, it's somebody else's fault because we didn't know about it or something like that. That, that's right. Yeah, and that, that plays into the the, the 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 broader issue of just, you know, cheap, easy political games and, and whatever is good for optics and whatever is good for brevity and simplicity rather than getting to the, the actual core of the issue. You know, it's a bit complicated because, you know, on one hand, like the, there is, you know, validity towards, you know, investigating in, into, you know, China's response is more in regard to like initially 
they're a bit slow in releasing some information and all that. And there needs to be some looking into there. And then also, and it's, it is irrelevant to like the immediate domestic response for us and in our, our American neighbors, for example, but you know, that, there, 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 there is necessity in a lot of the investigation into, you know, whether it leaked from a lab or not, and what's going on with this gain of function research, you know, if that's the cause of the pandemic. But other than that, you're absolutely right. It's completely, it, it is a deflection from their responsibility. Like it's, it's too late. The virus has spread. We do have problems at home. Like you can do both these things, these things simultaneously, mm-hmm. and and without like even just do do the investigations in a shrewd manner without playing political blame games. You can do both of those simultaneously as well. Yeah, and, China is not the one who forced everyone into cloth masks in Canada, and it's keeping the respirators from the healthcare workers. It's our own government, and and it's and it's going to keep happening because there's no. There's no incentive for changes and journalists don't care to investigate unless it fits a specific narrative. That's and right. so we came and get like basic journalist integrity to look into these problems. And these are problems that can be easily fixed if they were just looked simply looked into. And if a journalist spent a few hours to look into the problems, how easy would it be to bring to everyone's attention? And then when there's public pressure and the government can't say, oh, well, actually it's better to re- keep healthcare workers in surgical masks for A, B, and C, then give them last American respirators because there's no defense. So if they were, if the journalists were to simply ask basic questions to the government about why A is better than B, when experts and so many are asking for simple things like N95s and last American respirators and PPE that can form that can form a proper seal, then politicians only act under public pressure, and that's when we're going to have changes. And we we don't have anybody who seems to care because it's not a story about Ontario. It's not a story about a party you don't like, or it's not a story about somebody else's mistakes. So we can't talk about it at all. Like if you look at the CBC, it's been two weeks since that CBC investigation come out, came out. They know elastomeric respirators for sure now are better than N95s. They know they're being kept. So how come that hasn't made it into any of the other CBC investigations? Last week, Iona uh, Ramathopoulos, or I'm not sure how you say her name, uh, came out with a great uh, national investigation and uh, she interviewed Dr. Fisman and Mario Possumai and other union leaders, but not once did the CBC or anybody mention last American respirators. All they mentioned was N95s. So how come the CBC all of a sudden is still only saying N95s are all that's needed when they know there's better out there and they know it's already available and it doesn't even have to be bought. It's already paid for with taxpayer dollars. So there should be an investigation into why we're using millions of taxpayer dollars to fight unions in court to not hand out millions of dollars of respirators that are recommended as N95 alternatives when they know surgical masks aren't as as safe as uh, N95s. So what's the point in in doing all that? Like there's no real point in, in fighting unions to keep them in surgical masks. And when the CBC has known that the U S government said, the surgical masks are now banned around COVID patients. How come the CBC is not reporting on that issue either? Like, it, how is it that an entire country that's under scrutiny and is in media every day because the pandemic is the worst thing, and somehow not a single Canadian journalist is able to pick up that the fight that everyone has across Canada with unions and stuff like that is banned in the U.S. The things that healthcare workers are forced to use is banned in the U.S., but they don't ever mention that, and it's been now two weeks. Like, so it there's so much weird shit going on with journalists that there's no real investigation. It's just superficial work and uh, it has to fit like a certain narrative or they won't even look into it. Absolutely. Um, Well, I think we've gone for about three hours this time now, Nick Um, should probably wrap it up soon, but like, is there, is, is, is there any hopeful before we, we, we go, is there any hopeful outlook that you have, or do you think that there's, you, you mentioned what, what may occur with uh, the, the Washington post. And you said, you're going to try to look into some smaller outlets. Do you think there's any hope with some, you know, other small independent magazines in the U S or Canada, or, you know, do, do you think that there's, there, there's any uh, source that, that might start to actually, you know, talk about this, this issue uh, in a more realistic way? Uh, it's hard to know because some of the people that have done great reporting, 
um, include Christina Jewett from The Guardian in Kaiser Health News. She was uh, the person who broke the investigation about how 3,600 healthcare workers died because they were forced into surgical masks. Oh, yeah. And she's also the one who wrote about the U.S. government uh, banning surgical masks using going to elastomeric respirators. And I begged her to write stories on elastomeric respirators and look into why they're not being used. She doesn't care. So she, she's written stories about how they're being used, but there's no interest to go back. Now, Alexander Tin is another example. Back in March, he's a CBS News uh, journalist who works uh, for the White House or who covers the White House and COVID issues. And I reached out to him about elastomeric respirators and he didn't care to investigate. But he did tag me when, on April 9th when the U.S. government said that the PPE shortage was over. And instead of uh, having to reuse an N95, use an elastomeric respirator. And so he tagged me in that because he knew I was the one who brought elastomeric respirators to him, but he refuses to look into elastomeric respirators. So it's hard to know because some of these journalists are really intelligent and you'd think it would just be black and white and it would be something easy to look into, especially when they're already talking about it and, and they know about it, but there's no interest. So is it because they're not allowed to look into it or are, are they actually trying to look into it and their editors are not allowing them or producers like Natalia Goodwin, but how come Natalia, for example, how come Natalia is not able to include certain things about like political negligence in it, into it? Like it's, it's an important pro part of the story when there's politicians that are actively preventing these respirators from being used and from information from being known, you'd think that's something that would be important for the CBC to report on, but no, they're just going to talk about uh, something the, the PC government did two years ago that was responsible for something else. So there's, I think there's hope, but I think until we can chip and get a single politician to bring this up as an important issue, it's not going to happen. So what would be great is for everybody listening to this podcast to email and call Franchinina's office to look up her phone number, look up her email, as well as John Fraser in uh, CBC and like the CBC newsroom and say, speak up. Like you, people are aware that you're aware. And if you don't speak up, you're not going to be able to pretend like you, you didn't know this problem was going on and it's somebody else's responsibility. It's your responsibility as a health critic to criticize the government so that changes can be made. So if energy is focused, but a lot of times I'll ask people to talk to one politician or another, and then they, nothing gets done because they think other people are going to do it. So then nobody actually does it. So what would make a big difference is everybody listening to the podcast, take the time to focus and energy. For example, if you're in Canada, talk to Franchina, Don Davies, Michelle Rempel, Garner, and John Fraser. These are the opposition health critics. And these are the people that should be, have said something a year ago, but they don't care enough about criticizing the government because they'd have to say we should have done it a year ago, but we screwed up ourselves. And in the U S if you talk to somebody uh, it would be important to talk to, for example, a Democratic person uh, like Dick Durbin. He actually started investi uh, congressional investigations to look into this problem. But none of these investigations involve elastomeric respirators. So in the U.S., you should ask the Dick Durbin and your politicians why there's no investigation into why the CDC misled the public to believe surgical masks were safe and why they refused to let the public know about the recommendations to use elastomeric respirators and when they plan to hold their first press conference of the pandemic so that people know to use these respirators. Because if there's, no, if there's nobody going after these people, then they're going to try and get away with it. And they're going to hope it's only going to fall, the fallout's going to be on the government and the people in charge and that they can get away scot-free with all this. So if people know that people are aware that they, that they know they should be saying something, then they're likely to say something. Then if they know a lot of people know that they should have spoken up, there's going to be pressure for them to then speak up. And that's when something is going to happen. Yeah. And like, I, I forgot to bring up before too, like you mentioned uh, Mr. Turnbull and my, uh, I, I was more surprised that he was actually giving you the, the time of day at first. And, and I really believe, or I, I'd think, I shouldn't say believe, I'd think that, that he, he was being authentic um in his concern and in and, and that he actually went to the hospitals and all that jazz and and was was uh, upset about it but I, I i was surprised he put that much initiative into it in the beginning and then i wasn't mm -hmm. so surprised the way it went I, i'd bet everything i own 
that after a point in time, you know, somebody from the whip's office uh, mm-hmm. kicked, kicked him in the shin. And I, 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 in, in Ottawa, I've seen like it got bad with, with Mr. Harper and it's gotten much worse with Mr. Trudeau is the, the, the party leader is just uh, a dictator. And, you know, mm-hmm. so much of the, the other, well, even, even the hot, like, look at with the prime minister, what happened to the, the most of the high profile with the exception of maybe Miss Freeland, so many of the high profile uh, members of his cabinet, you know, mm-hmm. Raybold, Philpot, Morneau, big players to just to cover his ass, will get tossed into the wood chipper on a whim. Mm-hmm. You know, these are huge names in Canadian politics and top members of his cabinet and they don't matter. So if you're like Mr. Turnbull and like he's hasn't been in office very long, he so he would have got that seat after his, his predecessor resigned out of, you know, her pouty little fit that she had there. Uh good riddance. And uh so he, he so he's a backbencher, he's new to politics, you know, and so like to squash him would be nothing mm-hmm. you know and, and they're not going to listen to him like sometimes some of these smaller members they can put in a private member's bill or something and you know then the like the, the cabinet's not, not going to care but they, I, i'm surprised he was allowed to make as many noises as he did the and, thing is what's what's preventing him from blowing the whistle anonymously on the party he doesn't have to say that it's from him he can get somebody else to say you know there's the guy gonna Canadian, publish it yeah well, anybody who anybody could publish it, he could talk off the record to uh, say, like, talk to a journalist and say, you know, keep my name away from this because I don't want any fallout from my party. But this is going on. Like, the Canadian government knows that it's airborne. They know it's not droplet. They know that they need to let the public know about the recommendations to use last American respirators because nobody knows that they're used. And they know that they need to pressure for it because these respirators are readily available for over a year. And unions are fighting to have to get their healthcare workers out of surgical masks, but the government's deciding to spend more money to keep them in surgical masks and keep buying surgical masks than give the respirators that they wouldn't have to buy anything else after again. And then even when you look at NDP, like uh, Jimmy West, you even asked him, like, why is he not saying anything? And then he blocked you. And then, yeah. and then Jamie was saying in January after seeing like the, the Radio Canada investigation where unions were asking for it, saying, oh, there's no evidence that anybody besides me is asking for it. And unless they ask me pers- personally, I'm not going to say anything. And now the CBC investigation came out. It's been two weeks. So it's shown that it's not just me, but somehow he still refuses to speak up. So, and I doubt he's going to ever apologize. He's going to try and blame something or try and blame me for something or blame the government, but he's never going to apologize. And then he's going to try and get reelected and saying he's for the people and he's going to do anything in his power to make sure his constituents are cared for and looked after. Oh, the, the and, Ontario yeah. NDP are, already have their, their next election platform. Doug Ford bad. That, that's their, that, that's their <laughs> platform coming up. So they don't, they don't need anything else. And I don't know how they're going to be able to hide from this problem either. Like I, I made sure to make, make everything public so that they couldn't hide from it down the road. They couldn't ignore it or pretend like they didn't know it. So it's going to be interesting what, when it's actually break, when this news act breaks and there's accountability, what every party's going to do, because it's going to be a shit show. Like everyone's going to blame everybody else, but no one's going to take responsibility. And it's going to be interesting to see what their excuses that they come up with. Like that, that Spider-Man meme where they, they're both pointing at each other. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll, we'll see what happens. And like, even at the CBC, like, like nationally, like Natasha Fata has, has covered a, a lot of, of, of great uh, COVID topics that nobody else at the national CBC is really talking about and really specific issues. She's done a lot of, of coverage actually talking to specific healthcare workers. And, you know, she seems to be one of the last real journalists there. And um, so you know, hopes, hopes there. But then again, too, you mentioned like maybe some of the, there, there's just like a list of issues where, you know, producer will just say, no, 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 no. And so who knows what's going on there. Yeah. But, and yeah. CBC has misinformation on the last American respirators too. They, uh, they came out with the marketplace uh, article in November where they sh- talked about 20 different masks and they explained how any mask with an exhalation valve is too dangerous and should be avoided. And they cited the government information. I begged Franchina to get removed 
back to, early in the summer in July, and she said it wasn't important and she wouldn't do it. And then well, she, she had to worry about that that chocolate bar and Doritos fill, you know. <laughs> yeah, we we can't get anybody like a chocolate bar if they're hungry, you know. Can't get them a pack of gum or anything. Yeah. And, and if you look, even CTV, like in uh, April or sorry, in August of last year, uh, Alexandra May Jones, who's a very young journalist who didn't even care enough to do her due diligence to look at the links she included in her article because she also said elastomeric rest or any mask with a valve was dangerous. And then she cited the government information both from Canada and Ontario. But the CDC link she included uh, explained how you could easily cover the valve with a surgical mask so it wouldn't be dangerous. But all her article was talking about is avoid anything because they're just, just dangerous. She never mentioned how you could safely use it. And I contacted her. I contacted the CTC, CTV. I contacted CBC when they came out. And they refused to take it down. They said, that's what the government says, so we're leaving it up. And uh, even though they had proof and they could have easily looked at their own links, they didn't. she didn't even look at her own link. And uh, so... It's uh, it's shoddy journalism, and there needs to be accountability for for that kind of thing too. Because when the public sees that that's informa- misinformation, and you're scaring people away from PPE you know is safe, especially after you've seen the government websites that recommend it, then you should you you shouldn't be spreading fear mongering about avoid this at all costs. You should say some of them might be dangerous, but this is how you can make it safe. You don't just say avoid at all costs. It's too dangerous. It's going to kill people. You just tell them the truth. You say, this is how you make it safe. Uh, if this is the only option, it's better than no option. But just don't, don't say that uh, it's too dangerous and should should never be used. And then refuse to make any changes once you realize you made the mistake. So it's uh, to make sure there's accountability. Yeah, well, I'm I'm losing you, Nick. But let's. Uh, I, I guess your your Wi-Fi. Oh, is, oh, oh, you back? You yeah. So yeah, well, I'm back. All right. Well, well. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, this starts getting a lot more coverage. We'll see how it goes with with, with Wapo, and you know, hopefully, somebody, maybe somebody at McLean's, even start to pick this up here. But it's not looking good. But um, anyway. So people can find you at uh, Pete, or is there b- before we we fully fully sign off? Anything else you you, you want to throw out there, or do we um, we cover all? I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, like like uh, we have to think of this not just as a a nation or a city or like a province or a state. We have to think of this problem as a global problem because this pandemic is not going to go away unless we protect everyone around the world from the virus because there's going to be new mutations. It's not just going to be the alpha, beta, gamma, delta. We're going to be, we're going to have the whole alphabet by the end of the year (laughs) if we don't do something. And and it's so easy to do it. And it's so much more cost effective to take it seriously and take the precautions than to ignore it and pretend they don't exist because we can easily do this, even though the government is greedy, the government's not going to change. If we can get corporations to understand the importance of things like elastomeric respirators, we can get these mining companies to then donate it to places where they operate like Africa, uh, South America, Asia, because they're already looking to improve the relationships with the people in that area. And they want to protect that workforce. So it's great press for these places to buy elastomeric respirators, or sometimes they already have them in their operations and just to donate them. And they can get tax deductions. So it's something they can get pressed. Uh, they can get tax deductions. They can get like great press for it. And they could protect so many people and improve the relationships with so many people. And they're already looking to do that. And by making sure we can use corporations, we can bypass the government because the government's so ineffective anyways. We can get something done within weeks instead of years. And we can make sure that uh, we can actually end the pandemic. We don't have to live with the pandemic. We can try and get rid of it altogether to reduce it to nothing. But we also have to make sure it's not just PPE. We also have to make sure they have vaccines as well and they have safe vaccines and not just whatever country doesn't want to use because they don't feel it's safe for their people. So we need to we need to be there for ever, our neighbors around the world. And if we keep fighting with other countries, we're, we're just going to be fighting with this pandemic for for a long time. And if we don't do something now, it's going to be harder to get rid of the pandemic later because every mutation, it keeps getting worse and worse. So yeah. it, 
there's going to be a point where it's going to spread so fast. There's going to be more than just 2% of the people dying in these long-term care. It's going to be, you know, it could be 10% of the population dying and it spreads even faster than all the other ones. So it, it, it's going to ruin, it's going to ruin any progress we have. And if we want to keep the effectiveness of the vaccine, we have to make sure vaccines are used effectively and they're also used with other mitigation measures like ventilation and masks. Well, you, you really inspire happy thoughts into people's minds. <laughs> so, uh, so for, for, for more happy messaging, uh, find Nick at, uh, at PPE to heroes on Twitter and anything anywhere else that you're, you're kicking around these days that people can harass you or keep tabs on you. You can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn as well. That's another one I use. Um, I live in Sudbury, so just look for my name and then Sudbury. Just knock to, on uh, doors. And, yeah. yeah. Just, just, just go around the block. It'll and, find and, you eventually. And, and LinkedIn's nice because with LinkedIn, I can actually have more than 180 or 280 characters and I can have longer posts. So there's different things like studies I could put and PDFs and things like that where with, with uh, Twitter, it's hard to do. And for example, my la- I think one of my last ones was actually about the studies the Canadian government has told the public health agencies to make it really hard for anybody to know it's there, but I made it readily available so anybody can get that PDF. So you can see the studies that the Canadian government doesn't want the public to know about, which shows that they know that it's airborne transmission and all the studies and it explains it in detail. And uh, Crystal Mundy on Twitter uh, has a has a great Dropbox and tweet as well. So you should, you can, you should look that up because she has a lot of the studies on ventilation and how the government also knows that it's dangerous for children and there's uh, severe effects happening for, for children as well, even though the government says we don't even have to worry about any things for children because they're somehow immune from, from any of the problems from the virus. So it's, uh, so look at that as well. And you can see there's a lot of information that uh, you can get from that and try and get other people to look at that information too, because once journalists realize that information is out there, they should be asking the questions why this isn't public and why the Canadian government asked to the public health agency of Canada to actively hide it from the population and why they refuse to speak up when provinces says there's no evidence whatsoever of airborne transmission. So it's not even worth taking any kinds of precautions. Um, And there should also be a criminal investigation because people are dying and there's criminal negligence. People knew that there'd be deaths if some of this information wasn't known. So there should be an RCMP criminal investigation into all the people that were new about these problems and actively help prevent that information from being known and actively kept things like respirators and safe PPE from, uh, from healthcare workers and then lied to the public about it. So there should be, there should be uh, legal accountability as well or uh, criminal liability as well. Yeah, and that'll probably be long after the fact when it won't you know, help anybody anymore in the short term <laughs> and will drag on for years and... Yeah, hopefully. But anyway, thanks a lot. And uh, I'm sure this won't be the, the last we'll be hearing from you or everybody else. So thanks again. And we'll, we'll probably be doing this again. Well, I look forward to it. Thanks for listening to this episode. The music you hear on this show is from the Jeff Lap Trio out of Montreal. Find them at jefflap.com. Shout out to Tara for doing the graphics for COVID on air. A huge thanks to my editor, Jeff, at Bean Co. Studios in Regina, Saskatchewan. Please visit ncoronavirus.org for more information on ECV. Click on Join Us. Through that, you can volunteer with ECV. And you can subscribe to our newsletter, which is full of great information, shot straight to your inbox from our delightful newsletter editor, Tracy. Also, please check out the blog at ECV. And hats off to Scott, our impeccable blog editor. You can find ECB on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter at NCOVID19. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Farden. It's at M-R-F-A-R-D-E-N. Until next time.